Ma'am, we are in live. Oh. Uh, a very good evening to one and all of you for yet another educational initiative of the I Foundation Group of Hospitals. Murli, Murli, can you complete? Uh -huh. uh, madam, uh, Chitra, madam, she's gone offline. Uh, yeah, she's mute, uh, uh, Dr. Chitra. Madam, you're mute, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, uh, I think I suddenly network went. Murli, keep watch. You have to take on if something goes wrong. Yes, uh, so this is going to be a very interesting webinar, a global perspective on neuro-ophthalmology and this is the first part. So you can be sure the next two parts are going to be as interesting, if not more. We are truly lucky to have on our expert panel, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, who is an absolute top-notch figure uh, in the strabismus and neopediatric ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmic field of not just our country, but uh, globally, and is presently a senior consultant at the Center for Sight Group of Hospitals at Delhi after a huge stint as the uh, ex-professor and head of strabismus, uh, pediatric ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmology at the RP Center, All India Institute. We are truly lucky to have with us Professor Rohit Saxena, who is professor and in charge of the strabismus service at the RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, uh, New Delhi. We are really lucky to have another very renowned figure, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, who is presently the director of the Axon MedTech Private Limited Hyderabad. Again, a great teacher, and we look forward to learning a lot from him, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Rohit, and Dr. Rashmin. We are lucky to have with us Dr. Umapati Tirunyanam, who is Again, uh, uh, from the National uh, Neuroscience Institute, Singapore, another very uh, eminent uh, figure in the field of neuro-ophthalmology. We are truly lucky to have with us Dr. Ambika Selvakumar, who is the director of the neuro-ophthalmology department at Shankar Netralia, Chennai. And with all these experts and with my uh, uh, chief moderator, Dr. Murlidhar, who is a senior consultant, Glaucoma Pediatric Society, Strabismus and Neuro-ophthalmology, unit of the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals based at Coimbatore, I think we can really look forward to a very great meeting this time. Uh, is our... Mulik, you can hear me? Madam, uh, yes, Madam, Dr. John. Uh, he's not reachable, so can we uh, start with uh, uh, Dr. Rohit and then Dr. Celia, Madam? Okay. Well, you would want it that way? Okay. So... Yeah, I'm trying to contact him, Madam. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. So, uh, should I share, share screen? Yeah, uh, yeah. we look forward to starting off a little change in order with uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena, who is going to talk on a very important relevant topic for our country, which is tuberculosis and the optic nerve. So on to you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, uh, Morley, uh, for the opportunity and uh, uh, hello to everybody who's tuned in. Uh, tuberculosis and the optic nerve may sound a little unusual, especially considering the fact that we are discussing such wide variety of uh, disorders, which are wide ranging, which have a lot of other issues also. But tuberculosis, unfortunately for us in India, is such a big issue that I don't think you can ever discuss any problem without having tuberculosis as the elephant in the room being missed. So uh, tuberculosis can result in vision related problems. And we'll start with vision related problems. One, by the direct infection or involvement of the visual pathway anywhere along its course. So uh, from the optic nerves right up to the occipital lobe, and we'll see some examples, whether it's tuberculosis directly or tubercular meningitis, direct infection and involvement of the visual pathway can present with sudden visual, with visual loss. Tubercular meningitis can present with hydrocephalus with secondary optic atrophies. Direct infection, of course, retrochiasmal will present with primary optic atrophy. Tubicular meningitis with hydrocephalus will result in raised intracranial pressure, which will cause secondary edema and then secondary optic atrophy and can be a very, very important cause uh, for vision loss. Again, tuberculomas uh, can occur anywhere. And this is the photograph that I'm just showing you. You can see the tuberculomas getting involved everywhere. Here, this tuberculoma is right sitting on the chiasma and causing a compressive oblique direct involvement toxic optic neuropathy. Uh, and of course, finally, the most important thing we'll be discussing about is toxic optic neuropathy. 
uh, which is something that we are all worried about. Uh, so we'll just start with a couple of cases, just showing you how uh, you know tuberculosis can present to us. This 21-year-old female was uh, diagnosed with tubercular meningitis, was being treated with ATT for three months, and then one week ago she she had diminution of vision and she presented to us. Her vision was very poor, sluggishly reacting pupils, and bilateral disc pallor. Now, uh, three months ATT, including ethambutol. Your first thought would be that this is toxic optic neuropathy. But because there was neurological involvement in the first go itself, although the initial imaging just showed tubercular meningitis, which was the basis of diagnosis, here you can see a repeat imaging showed multiple lesions. So actually the disease is worsening. And this is the most important thing from our perspective. The moment you're thinking of toxic optic neuropathy, you're actually asking for withdrawal of one or more of the interventions, whereas in this case, you can see there is a progressive increase. There is a breakthrough on treatment and worsening. And this is an important intervention. Not only are we going to talk about withdrawal of ethambutol, of course, because it is difficult and that can be discussed, but uh, that the treatment should be up. So it's important to image the moment you have a patient with neurological involvement of, um, of the brain or anywhere in the pathway with tuberculosis. So... Uh, now, another patient with tubercular meningitis presented with diminution of vision for one month on ATT and prednisolone uh, had uh, everything else looking normal. Again, an imaging was required. This was a patient with a commu non-communicating hydrocephalus. And you can see this the, the, widened, uh, uh, the widening here, the ooze in the periventricular area, all these showing that there is a raised intracranial pressure. Obviously, managing and upping the treatment is, is, the, is the key for managing these patients. A 30-year-old male presented with recent onset diminution of vision. He was on ATT again, including ethambutol. Recently, uh, ethambutol and INH was stopped by the physician. The vision was 636 in, in, the right, in the left and 612 in the right. And when we got the fields done, uh, again, it's the first most important thing to do is the fields. You can see this is the kind of image the, the field that the patient had. Again, it's important uh, to get an imaging done because why he did not have neurological tuberculosis, he had pulmonary cox. But uh, when you see this, you know that there is something else going on. And again, this was a patient with uh, a, a tuberculoma sitting just on top of the cella and not all vision loss is due to toxicity. Another patient who had an orbital involvement. So you can see left proptosis, Subnormal vision uh, in the left eye, uh, mildly. This is the field, not very clear, but there was uh, a disc edema bilateral. You can see that left eye, there was disc edema. The right eye started showing signs uh, of a little bit of an edema that was developing. Again, an imaging of the orbit showed extensive involvement of the orbit. Of course, this does not uh, definitely show that there is tuberculosis. This shows that there is and inflammation there, the chest had hilar lymphadenopathy suggestive of tuberculosis. He was presumed to be because of tuberculosis and orbital involvement. We started him on ATT and uh, he resolved along with steroids and he resolved over time. Of course, there was mild vision loss that persisted. Like I said, no discussion on tuberculosis is possible without discussing toxic optic neuropathy. It presents with mild to severe bilateral painless loss of vision. Uh, initially, they may just complain of color desaturation. Usually, they are more or less symmetrical. The patient may not complain of clinical symptoms and may have just subclinical toxicity also, and they may just be incidentally picked up. The fundus may show uh, essentially normal in the initial phases when they present to us, but over time, they will have uh, optic atrophy. They may have central or central sequel scotomas. OCTs are now becoming important because they can pick up early ganglion cell loss, which can later on translate to RNFL loss also. The other important thing is an increased latency on the visual evoked potentials, which is important. And the other important thing to remember, many studies, including from our center, has shown that there is subclinical involvement in almost up to 50% of the patients who do not actually come with any obvious loss. So it's important that ethambutol can cause subclinical involvement showing changes in the RNFL in these patients. Besides the thambutol, INH and INH and lazulid has also been implicated now in causing a toxic optic neuropathy, but ethambutol still becomes the first culprit, not only because it is, it is a higher prevalence or incidence of toxicity, but also the fact 
that with the new regime we'll be talking about, it is almost the most common drug that is being given to patients. Important to remember, there are other causes. So you could have mitochondriopathy or LHON. Sometimes an LHON patient, because of his predisposition to toxic to neuropathies, presents early on may not actually have toxic may not have a presentation of LHON, but because of the toxic insult may present with us. So it's important sometimes if you're not very clear or the dosage is not too high or too long to actually look for LHN also. But of course, as I mentioned, there can be a lot of other differentials that we need to rule out. The major change has been from 2016 and by 2018 when this was incorporated is the major change in the new guidelines, which has now become daily. Now we are giving ethambutol for at least up to six months on a fixed dose combination. So it becomes very difficult to advise the patient to stop just ethambutol because then up till now on a fixed dose, he's getting free from the government, but now he may have to purchase it on his own because DOTS is not uh, giving separate doses and therefore it's an important decision that we need to take. The revised program, although there are safety features, but the dose of ethambutol can reach up to 25, 20 milligrams in adults and 25 milligrams in children, those at the lower end of the weight band. There is an increased risk if there is malnutrition, alcohol intake, tobacco abuse, or if there is other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, nephropathy, and of course, concurrent use of INH or linozolid. We need to be alert because almost 25 lakh people are on ethambutol in India at any given time. This, of course, were the guidelines we had uh, created and uh, that resulted in publications. And these are the important things. I'll just quickly run through the suggestions or the advice that we have for ophthalmologists and everybody. It's important to know that the incidence increases with dose and duration. And of course, greater risk in older patients, those with hypertensive, chronic smokers, alcohol, or presence of renal disease. So these are important red flags. And any patient who starts a on with these comorbidities must be advised to get a regular screening. The clear, there is no clear idea about why it occurs, but there is a possible zinc or copper chelating property, which results in a damage to the oxidative pathway and the retinal ganglion cells are particularly susceptible because they have high cellular mitochondrial content. No effective treatment, early detection and stopping is the important intervention. Uh, besides that, you can give vitamin supplementation, including zinc, methylcobalamin and pyridoxin, good nutrition, managing the comorbidities and regular follow-up. Have a, For ophthalmologists, have a high index of suspicion, opportunistic screening if a patient on ATD comes to you, and as I mentioned, early detection and warn these patients. Most important thing is to increase awareness among anybody who's treating patients with ATT, anyone with high risk who's on higher doses, longer duration, renal impairment, diabetes, tobacco, alcohol, poor treatment with linozolid, pre-existing visual dysfunction. In fact, if patient has pre-existing visual dysfunction, we tend to advise them not to, to give ethambutol because it can be difficult to pick up early loss. And those with high risk, should undergo an evaluation regularly. Ask the physician to be aware about optic neuropathies and the patient may just be asked verbally if he has any visual complaint and if he complains that during follow-up, the patient should be referred to an ophthalmologist. At a patient level, create awareness. There may be a questionnaire which is possible, especially with the physician so that he can ask these questions to patients whenever they're coming at the DOT center for follow-up. So again, patients should be advised we need to notify if we have this. This is the most important thing. It's a responsibility of ophthalmologists and physicians because even now there is very little reporting of toxic optic neuropathy at an individual or as a hospital level. So essentially, it's important for us to be aware and to be very sensitive to this. As I said, managing is uh, prevention is the best, but we can advise medical uh, supplementation of vitamin. So essentially, there is a huge variety in which tuberculosis can affect the visual system. But most importantly, of course, is it ambitol toxicity and recently some reports of linozolid related toxicity, which we should be aware about. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thanks a lot, Dr. Roy. That was a superb talk for a non neuroophthalmologist like me. So then what would be a quick screening method for ethambutol toxicity, like even before you go on to the fields, like as soon as the patient starts telling you? To color? The most, one of the most sensitive is color. And of course, from a test point of view, electrophysiology. So uh, increase in latency, if you suspect. And uh, of course, contrast also starts getting affected. So higher visual functions or specialized functions like color followed by contrast, visual evoke potentials, 
and uh, of course uh, over time visual fields so these would come in that order very early and as i mentioned you can just ask any patient on att on ethambutol can be just asked to be aware of the color of the same thing that he's seeing on a daily basis so a colored calendar he just sees every day and the day he starts feeling that the color is not looking as bright as it normally did is the earliest sign he would have and that's the time when he should report to us okay on to you murli um so have you had any uh, patients with an asymmetric vision loss that may cause some confusion uh, uh, in patients whom you have suspected ethambutol toxicity yes to an extent yes although not very severe asymmetry but yes asymmetric loss has been has been there so one eye would be virtually normal although again like i said color contrast may be affected the visual loss may not be significant but one eye may show marked visual loss so as i mentioned if there is pre existing pathology or there is pre existing that itself becomes a confounder in this but yes asymmetric involvement is known in patients with ocular tuberculosis who are already who are on uh, att uh, are there any challenges in identifying ethambutol toxicity they may have vision loss because of other causes and have you encountered that kind of a thing tuberculosis so it is yes so one of the recommendations that was felt by the group and that everybody feels is or i personally also feel that if a patient has a pre existing visual dysfunction that patient should be preferably avoided whether it's because of a neurological tuberculosis whether it's because of the ocular tuberculosis if possible we should avoid ethambutol in them because as i mentioned catching it early will be a very very big challenge so a uh, treating physician including ophthalmologist may just relate it to the uveitis or to the uh, the ocular pathology while at underlying basis you are having a toxic neuropathy and then whatever you treat you may treat the uveitis but the visual dysfunction will remain so our advice would be to definitely avoid ethambutol in these patients and of course if that cannot be avoided have a very very close and sensitive follow up and if there is any deterioration in the absence of the disease increasing that itself becomes a red flag so a closer follow up in these patients with visual evaluation and if there is any deterioration in the absence of the worsening of the primary disease that itself becomes a very high you know sign or suggestion of ethambutol toxicity uh, dr Ch john chen has uh, said that he'll be joining in another 15 minutes so uh, dr celia you sir. could go next madam you can introduce thank you yeah thank you yeah. sir thank you very much thanks a lot dr rohit uh we go on to our next talk by uh, professor celia chen and uh, she's a professor a clinical professor with the university of south australia an academic professor at flinders uh, university she's a consultant neuro ophthalmologist and a clinical scientist she is the current president of neuro ophthalmic society of australia and she has an excellent research record and is actually a recipient of national and international scholarships and awards and uh, a and she is actually dedicated to providing mentorship and learning opportunities for the young ophthalmologists in the asia pacific and has done field work in cambodia for over 10 years providing fellowship opportunity through the apo women in ophthalmology international fellowship program kims uh, scholarship and eye surgeons foundation fellowship programs and we are truly lucky to have such an eminent uh, person like her amidst us in this webinar and she is going to tell us some uh, give us an update on liver's hereditary optic neuropathy on to you dr celia is she connected ma'am you are muted dr celia my apologies celia you are muted and, uh, yeah, yeah yeah we can hear you mm. No yeah. problem. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to the organizer and for the very kind invitation. It's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, um, so I've been asked to talk about Labour's hereditary optic neuropathy, LHON. And so look, let's start with what we call a typical story. Um, this is a 42-year-old man. Um, he works for the government house in South Australia. He lost his vision in the left eye. Past history include hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease, and uh, that was treated. Slideshow. You have to go on uh, slideshow. We don't see. We need to see okay. a full slide. Okay, that's it. Okay, let me try again. 
second time lucky okay i think it was okay can you see my can you see my slide now yeah yes yes that's great thank you um yes so i was talking about this typical case um so this is a gentleman who has lost vision in the left eye now he smokes cigarettes on the weekends and he says he's a social drinker now on this topic i must admit that uh, uh when i uh, when i live in australia i have noticed that the definition of why people say social drinker is very different from the rest of the world so you have to take it with a pinch of salt and i say so how much is social drinker for you he say oh about six bottles of wine every weekend so as i say we, we live in australia he has no significant past history and the left eye vision has reduced to six on 60, but there was no RAPD. And he could only see the control plate. And this is the visual field where the right eye is pretty normal, but in the left eye, we can see a central cecoscotoma developing. Now, this is the OCT scan for this gentleman at the onset. Now, in this day and age, I know that OCT is a very, very useful diagnostic tool, but if you look at this and look at that left optic nerve, it really doesn't look that impressive. And I always look at the back of the eye. And when I uh, teach my registrars, um, I actually get a little bit offended when they first show me the uh, OCT scan without telling me what they saw on the optic disc. So you can really appreciate that if you look at a disc versus this OCT scan, it's not that different. Uh, it, it is quite different. And uh, um, here you can appreciate this hyperemic edema appearance. And also very importantly, whenever we see an OCT scan, don't just look at it by itself. The OCT of the optic nerve does not give me enough information unless I compare it also with the OCT of the ganglion cell plot. And here you can appreciate we're dealing with a real disease and the real process because already we are seeing some ganglion cell loss that correlates very nicely with that central cecoscotoma. Now, so he was extensi um, extensively investigated for this left optic neuropathy, including neuroimaging, including vasculitic screen, visual evoke potential, and being unilateral, being a male, he was also investigated for inflammatory optic neuropathy. Now, the game plan at this stage is a unilateral optic neuropathy. But, okay, and this is the left optic nerve. We can see that even though at the onset, the uh, nerve fiber layer thickness was 106. And that's another thing that um, I'm hot on is people always sort of think, oh, 100 is the baseline. It is not. We know the flow effect, but we don't know the ceiling effect because the ceiling effect is different depending on many variables. There's no um, uh, age and refractive control at this stage. So the best thing we can do is compare apple to apple. So compare the same person and we can now start appreciating this ganglion, uh, this retinal nerve fiber layer dropout. But interestingly, look at this area, how we're seeing some of the hyperemic edema that we're discussing. Now, what's happening to the other eye? Have a look. The right eye that initially when I showed you the visual field was absolutely normal. We are now starting to see some of that hyperemic elevation, but also nerve fiber layer loss. And within a nine months period, the left eye, we're still seeing that central cecoscotoma, but now the right eye has dropped. Your game plan changes now. We're dealing now with a bilateral process, not a unilateral process. And when that second eye starts getting involved, what is happening here? Okay. We are seeing no, no evil here. There's nothing um, to see other than this loss of vision. So what do people want to do here? Well, being a labor's talk, you probably say, let's do some genetic test. And we did. Um, and there are some typical panels where we have the primary three mutations, the 11778, 14484, and 3460. But in all three of them, these are not detected. There is a homogeneous polymorphism that's detected in another variant. But in this case, what they are saying is that it is unlikely but not excluded because the primary mutations are not found. So what do people think at this point? With the negative test, but in a 
young person, young male with bilateral sequential loss of vision. What do we do now? And do people still think this is labor? So we need to go back and look a bit more for the process of bilateral loss of vision, such as MOG antibody, which I'm sure John will talk about in a second. Well, that's why I'm talking about updates. In this gentleman, what he ended up doing, it smells like labors, looks like labors, especially with um, a few important features, including when there's lots of vision in one eye, but there's no RAPD. That is very, very, there are only two possibilities. One is labors, and this is quite well described by the Japanese group. The second is the person is actually faking it. But as we can, and which I'm sure Rashmin will talk about, but as we can see in this case, we got the function that correlates with the structure, especially with that central sequel scotoma and the ganglion cell loss. So that is why I'm not resting here. I'm thinking it looks like labors. Just because we don't get that primary mutation, it doesn't mean there's no secondary mutation. So I send this person for a genome-wide mitochondrial mutation sequence. And lo and behold, they did find a pathogenic mutation. So yes, lo and behold, it is labors. And very lucky for him, this is one of the mutation, very similar to the 14484 that actually has a good prognosis. So the left eye that initially uh, became affected in January 2016, at his worst, at the trough, that was around November, we can see uh, 6150 vision. But the most recent time when I saw him, only about two weeks ago, you can see that the visual field improved. The right eye, he's actually got 6 on 6 vision, but there is a residual scotoma. Now, this is one thing I'm personally very, very uh, intrigued is we talked about it's always important to correlate the structure and the function. And I use OCT all the time, but look at this OCT. Okay, very same person two weeks ago on the 11th of December. This is the eye that has become six on six vision, six on 7.5. You wouldn't think that, would you? When you look at that circumferential ganglion cell loss, correlating with that visual field, okay? And yet, this is one of those things that continue to surprise us. So um, in labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, we've heard about 14484, that has a good chance of mutate, uh, good chance of recovery. And you have, uh, there are quite a lot of theories about why these people may recover. But I think at this stage, there's still a lot of uh, studies being done at the moment to see how we can try to modify such that people can have this good prognosis, even though we're seeing that nerve fiber layer drop out. So who is Labour and how and why did he name that? Um, I don't know if we have any German scholars in this group. And in his very first paper that described it, the original description is actually Labour's optic atrophy. Because by the time he described it, just like in this picture, the eye was actually quite atrophic. And uh, um, very sadly, a lot of the people have already lost vision in both eyes. Okay. Now, so what do we know? We do know that it is a mitochondrial disease. We know that we've got the five mitochondrial chain. And most of the time, the mutations happen, the three primary ones happen in the ND1, 4, and the 6 uh, subunits. But having said that, Look, we got five interconnecting um, units in this mitochondrial chain. And that is why there are so many of that secondary and even tertiary mutation that we are only scratching the surface. And that is why if you look at a lot of the uh, global initiatives and larger studies uh, of which in Australia were involved in some of these studies, uh, people are now doing what we call genome-wide sequencing in order to understand more about this mitochondrial disease. And it is important to know the, uh, to know the um, mutation because their prognosis are quite different. So definitely watch out for that next generation of diagnosis. Don't stop at your primary three mutations. Now, one of the big thing people always talk about is, yes, um, if, there's a family history. Um, if the uncle has lost vision and you hear about families where many of the male lose vision, um, what is the risk for the person? 
And this is where um, I'm pretty sure I got conned into doing this talk because I presented a case of a female with labors, which people did not suspect. Um, now, female also do become affected. And this is one of the big thing is that people think mitochondrial disease, maternal inheritance. So they think that that means um, the mom pass on the disease and the male are affected. I have to say maternal inheritance does not equal to X-linked. And the chance of this happening in female, and this is from um, our Australian study, we have quite a well-established uh, cohort, thanks to Professor David Mackey, who is instrumental in understanding this. Um, and we've established that the risk if there is a family with mutation in male is about 18% and in female is about 6%. So female are not immune, sadly, in this situation. And another thing, so it is not low, it is definitely there. But one of the things that people always talk about is then why do some people get it? Why do some people not uh, not get it? And um, I talk about social drinking in Australia and you hear people blaming smoke and alcohol and it's because they stress out the mitochondrial chain. But what we do know is that it is definitely, there's this issue of heteroplasmy and penetrance. And so that is why some of the families have the disease but not everybody develop it because it is an interplay of the genetic factors and the environmental factors together. And that is why you do hear people say, what can I do to protect myself when I do have a family history? And this is where um, we can't change our genetics, we can't change our family, but this is where the environment, um, em environmental factors may be something that plays a big part and you hear people using coenzyme Q10, idebitin, et cetera, in those situations. Now they are not, they are, um, uh, every country differ. I think that is uh, the situation. And in Australia, we are quite lucky that uh, in terms of uh, medication, because when we are talking about the uh, prescription, it is at the dosage of 300 milligram TDS. So it is quite a large dosage. And for the people who have established diagnosis within two years of onset, the government actually subsi subsidized them. Sometimes in days, but sometimes in years. Oh, sorry, and um, what I will mention is that there are actually variants of labors because there's also a deafness associated and also with MS, and there's also uh, with the genome-wide sequencing, we now know there's recessive labors that's happening. So watch this space. What is important is that, what is important, what is important is that when we do the differential, it is essentially any condition that causes a bilateral optic neuritis. So it is important to always consider the inflammatory conditions, infectious conditions, as Rohit very nicely talked about before. Now, so as a result, in any person who has a bilateral sequential loss of vision, we need to exclude any compressive causes along the chasm, and also we need to do the MRI to exclude inflammatory causes. We need to uh, do blood tests to exclude the vasculitic and infectious causes. And interestingly, just like in our gentlemen, um, the genome-wide sequence is actually done from the urine that actually allow us to do the mitochondrial DNA okay. analysis. One minute left. Now, I'll touch on quite briefly about um, treatment, which, uh, as I said, it differs depending on the country. These patients, they're desperate. These patients, they will go online, they will Google, they will try to source adebinum from overseas. Now, just remember, at this dosage, this is um, actually quite a large dosage. It's not the ones that people get from the healthcare stores. And that is why, as I said, if you look at the cost in Australia, it's the equivalent of $20,000 a year. So luckily, the government subsidizes that funding. And I'm sure there are differences in different country, but um, recently we had Tony Arnold uh, coming to Australia to speak at the Neuro Ophthalmology Society, and he was involved in a few gene studies. Um, and I was uh, an investigator that helped with screening and uh, assessing some of these patients. But Tony's assessment was actually very interesting because he actually really sub-analyzed. And so I think... Um, Definitely, there are quite a lot of interest in using gene studies to see if we can modify it. But I think the fair thing to say at this stage is we're not quite there yet. So 
what is important is maximize vision because we are looking at situations such as adaptive technology, which is a very, very big part now um, because these are young people and um, there are all these AI technologies which can help them to still function. That's quite important. So in conclusion, what is new with labors? Remember that in the diagnosis, don't stop with your primary three mutations. Genome-wide sequencing is available and it is becoming more uh, popular uh, for us to reach that correct diagnosis. It is a maternal inheritance that does mean that it can affect both men and women in this situation. And the risk in men is about 17 to 18%, in women is about 6% in a family with no risk factor. Genetic and environmental factor play a very large role and the management is um, adamant if you are able to access it and supportive measure, which is paramount for these people to maximize their residual vision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sidia. That was an amazing talk. Murli, can you take on? Yeah, I have a, a question for the panel and uh, Dr. Sidia. Uh, when would you consider uh, genetic testing for uh, blood relatives? I mean, let's say the mother has got affected and her son wants to know whether he's at risk uh, or not. Would you consider mitochondrial sequencing in asymptomatic uh, blood relatives to check if they have the mutation or not? Okay, so... um. So I must admit, I feel quite lucky in Australia because um, in Australia, Professor David Mackey has done a lot of work. And I have to say, I'm standing on the shoulder of the giants and acknowledge him with the, the work he does. It, it's almost uh, ironic that in Australia, if you had, I once had a patient, the one I presented with the as rare as Tasmanian tiger, it was an isolated case. I literally emailed him with the blood test result, he was then able to find it and link it to the actual family. So in Australia, there are in total 96 families with over um, 800 people. And they actually are able to, should I say, link them um, and have quite a well-established pedigree for each of these families. So um, we're probably lucky in that aspect that um, there are sort of established genetic situation. But say if somebody's de novo, Okay, and the mom, um, you know, say for instance, the mom is the carrier and the son wants to know the risk. I think what happens in this situation is what we call candidate gene approach. So if the mom has got an established gene, say a 1177A, then the son can then be tested for that specific one rather than a big fishing expedition. Uh, how long uh, would you give Idebinon? And uh, when do you say that... Uh... Um, it has uh, it has or has not worked. Okay, and I'm going to draw on the uh, um, I'm going to draw on what we call the uh, Australian PBS recommendation. Is that um, they found that the most useful time to give adenosine is when the first eye dropped and uh, before the second eye, and really as early as you started, that's helpful and. In Australia, as I said, we're quite lucky that um, the government actually funds this um, medication for, but when they fund the medication, they fund it for two years. Okay. And uh, so I don't know whether that means it's because after two years, they've already reached the NIDA, the, the trough. Um, and also, if we look at 14484, which is the one that has the chance of recovery, whether or, and the studies have shown that that's when we start to see the picking up. So um, so in general, I'm going by the recommendation of how long they can get the medication for free. And I will say that's two years. Yeah. I think uh, Dr. Ambika has a question for you. Uh, Dr. Ambika, yes. uh, yeah. <clears throat> come on. Yeah. Dr. Ambika? Yes, you... madam, uh, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, madam, you're muted. Hi, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, Celia, when do you decide to do a gene test for a female with bilateral optic neuropathy? Do you run the entire atypical workup for them? How do you take on it when the imaging is negative? Okay, so um, again, it comes down to clinical suspicion. Okay, so um, what happens is that um, the, the case I previously presented was a young female, 16 years old, who had bilateral sequential loss of vision. Now, if you go back to the history, 
what actually happened was that when the first eye vision dropped down, the there was no RIPD, just like in this one. And that is very, very suggestive of labors. So, you know, compared to, for instance, a young female where one vision dropped down, there was a good RAPD and the MRI showed some T2 lesion. So again, um, as I said, my different, just like in this case, the differential diagnosis will go from your uni investigation for your unilateral optic neuropathy to bilateral optic neuropathy and go back to the history to say, what well, are suspicious features in that unilateral? And secondly, in that bilateral, after you've ruled out your inflammatory optic neuropathy, and including demyelinating disease, okay, after you ruled out your vasculitic and infectious screen, that's when you do need to think about, are we dealing with hereditary? So, um, and I'm not sure in India how quickly you get a turnover for the genetic test result, because for instance, in Australia, I know I send them all to Melbourne, and uh, then I get a turnaround of the blood test results because it's run by a central body. Um, recently, I understand you guys have Angor from Taiwan visiting. And again, they've got quite a strong labor study group where they do their own testing. So, you know, it will also depend on in India, how quickly you get a turnaround and the center that you send to with their tighter testing. So if it takes a long turnaround, you probably need to start thinking and send it earlier rather than later. Thank you. Uh, shall we go on to our next speaker? Murli, you have some more questions. Anybody on the panel? Dr. John Chen has joined. It. So shall we? He has joined. Shall I? Will you check on that? Oh, no, yes. he's joining. He's joined. Okay. Um, uh, so we we waited for you, doctor. So I, uh, and in the interim, we took on two other speakers. So... We shall now uh, go on to the keynote uh, speaker, Dr. John Chen, who's a professor of ophthalmology and neurology at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. And um, he's uh, a very eminent neuro-ophthalmologist with innumerable awards and honors like the AO Achievement Award, the Ophthalmology Teacher of the Year Award, which he got three times. And, uh, and, uh, and sorry, very sorry. Um, and also he's on the board of the North American Neuro Ophthalmology Society and is on multiple committees for AO. He's a co-chair in the Upper Midwest Neuro Ophthalmology Group, is a member of the American Ophthalmology Society and Eye Study Club. He has served as the president for the Minnesota Academy of Ophthalmology and participated in AO and AUPO leadership uh, development programs. So and he's in and he has taken innumerable presentations and lectureships, named lectureships on his uh, topics of interest. And today this very eminent personality is going to tell us about the current and the emerging treatment options for NMO and Mogad diseases. Thank you, on to you. Great, well, thank you so much for the introduction. And I so deeply apologize for, I had my time zone off by an hour. I've actually been up since 4.30 in the morning here, our time just working on a grant, but again, I apologize for that. I would have definitely jumped on much sooner. And good evening to all of you uh, in India. Very excited to present on this topic, which is really one of my favorite topics. Um, these new treatments, current and new treatments for NMOSD and MOGAD. It's really amazing with these conditions in that, you know, with NMO, previously a blinding and paralyzing disease, we have as close to a near treatment as possible. We have have treatments now that have a 92% reduction in relapses, uh, which we'll talk about. For MOGAD, you, you know, five, six years ago, we didn't even know the disease existed. And now we have randomized clinical trials that are ongoing to try and get better treatments. So we'll step through for the next 25 minutes going through these treatments. Um, I'm a consultant to Horizon and UCB, but that won't have any relevance to this talk. Um, we'll talk about some chronic immunotherapies that are off-label for MOGAD because we have no FDA-approved medications for the disease. So as um, neuro-ophthalmologists, we all know that when we have a patient with demyelinating optic neuritis, we're faced with pretty much four main categories at this point. MS, which at least in a Caucasian population makes up about 50%. A third of our optic neuritis is still idiopathic, which means we don't know the cause. There's still some antibodies to be discovered. 
And then about um, 3% and 6% are caused by NMO and SD and MOGAD respectively. And we're going to focus on these diseases starting off with NMOSD. So the NMOSD really is a relapsing disease with, with poor outcomes if left untreated. Uh, we know that recurrent optic neuritis can cause blindness in up to 50% of patients. And, um, and that's why, again, we care about this disease as ophthalmologists, but it can affect other parts of the brain, most commonly transverse myelitis, where 50% of patients can end up wheelchair bound after recurrent attacks. And the mortality rates have been reported to be as high as 32% based on studies back in the 90s. But now with better recognition, better treatment, the most recent uh, mortality rate is 3%. And it's probably even lower now that we've got better medications. So we know that these attacks have very severe disability. So when you have a patient with NMOSD, the acute treatment needs to be IV corticosteroids. And we also recommend plasma exchange. Very, very different from your MS optic neuritis, where the optic neuritis treatment trial showed that IV steroids leads to faster recovery, but doesn't actually change the ultimate outcome. With NMO, we don't really have that option. We want to treat them as, as aggressively as possible. And some evidence for PLEX, um, this is a study, a large multi-center international study of almost 400 optic neuritis attacks that we looked at outcomes of plasma exchange, where we had what nicely kind of divvied up the etiologies between MS, MOGAD, M um, NMO, and idiopathic pretty equally, about 100 per group. Uh, essentially, what we found is that patients presenting um, with optic neuritis who received PLEX presented with very severe vision loss, you know, with a median visual acuity of count fingers. And after plasma exchange, very significant recovery with a median final visual, visual acuity of 2025. Uh, we found that in this large cohort of about 400 patients treated with PLEX, 43% recovered to 2020, two thirds or 2040 or better, but not every patient recovered. 20% um, still ended up 2200 or worse. Uh, we further stratified that based on etiology, and here you can see that aquaporin-4, again, present with very severe vision loss, but for the most part did pretty well after PLEX. Again, a pretty significant recovery, but again, we have these outliers that did more poorly. Further stratifying, one of the biggest um, factors that predicted outcomes was actually time to PLEX treatment. You can see here in green, this is complete recovery. Red is poor recovery. You can see that treatment within one week of symptom onset, there's a high percent of patients that had complete recovery, a pretty low percentage of patients with poor recovery. But if you're treating them over 20, you know, about a month out, you know, the percentage of patients with complete recovery goes much lower. And so we do think that PLEX leads to better outcomes for NMOSD and earlier treatment is better there's that the verbiage, time is vision. So acute treatments, um, IV corticosteroids plus PLEX, early treatment probably leads to better outcomes. Really because this is a relapsing disease, all patients require long-term immunotherapy. And rituximab was the classic first-line therapy um, and some older alternatives are azathioprine and mycophenolate. I just wanted to step through some of these medications. But one important thing before we talk about these treatments is that MS medications, the traditional ones like interferons, are, uh, may, are ineffective for NMO and may even increase the relapse rate. And so they're contraindicated in this disease that previously had been uh, thought to have a mortality rate as high as 32%. So again, if you've got a patient with optic neuritis, you have to think, you know, could this be NMO? Because it changes your prognosis, but more importantly, it changes your treatment options. So in terms of long-term treatment options, we've got our broad spectrum immunosuppressive treatments like azathioprine. Retrospective studies suggest it does lead to reduction in relapses. But more recently, there were two open-label randomized clinical trials that showed lower efficacy of azathioprine compared to both rituximab and tocilizumab. So really, it's not, it's certainly an option is better than nothing, but it's not quite as good as some of these new monoclonal antibodies. We also have mycophenolate, one of the older traditional medications that we use. No randomized clinical trials, but um, several retrospective and meta-analyses have suggested that it does lead to reduction in relapses. But again, what's really important now is we have um, treatments, the monoclonal antibodies that 
probably are very effective or are effective for this. We have randomized clinical trials showing it, that they're effective. Um, again, the most traditional one is rituximab, which depletes B cells by blocking CD20. And so here's the schematic here. And essentially CD20 is expressed by mature B cells. And um, by blocking these B cells, uh, we block the formation of plasma cells, which again, are what's responsible for creating acuporin 4 antibodies, which are vital to the pathogenesis of NMOSD. So rituximab, again, has a lot of uh, work that's been done. We have multiple retrospective studies showing has good efficacy in preventing attacks in NMOSD. And more recently, there was actually a randomized clinical trial done in Japan um, where patients were uh, received rituximab every six months, which is the standard treatment for rituximab. Um, they only had 19 patients per group, so pretty small study. But what they found is, in that the 19 patients treated with rituximab, they had zero relapses compared to 37% of patients that relapsed on placebo. And so that was, again, showing that it's very, very effective in uh, preventing relapses in this pretty devastating disease. So we also have enobolizumab, uh, the more recent B cell depleter, and it blocks CD19. And the thought of CD19, where the theory was it may be potentially better than rituximab, is that CD19 is expressed in B cells throughout development, including plasma cells. So you're not only blocking your mature B cells, but you could potentially um, block plasma cells that are already created. Again, it's really unclear if enobolizumab is better than rituximab. Um, I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I think enobolizumab is certainly very, very effective. And there was the N-Momentum study um, that was published in Lancet in 2019, a very, very large study. You can see 174 patients treated with enobolizumab compared to 56, uh, per, uh, 56 patients treated with placebo. The enobolizumab is also in IV infusion every six months. And you can see this uh, kaplan meyer curve showing uh, the probability of attack is um, much higher in patients treated with placebo. Essentially, 12% of patients treated with enobolizumab have a relapse compared to 39% uh, on placebo. And so this led to a overall 73% reduction in attacks, 77% among patients who are ACPORN4 positive. So again, a very large reduction in attacks compared to placebo, proving that this medication works by blocking B cells. And so in our uh, treatment algorithm, we have rituximab blocking CD20, we've got enobolizumab blocking CD19, both have been proven to be effective uh, in preventing relapses in, in NMOSD. Another class of medications are IL-6 inhibitors. We have tocilizumab and satralizumab. And IL-6 is involved in the pathogenesis of NMO. Um, and you can see it here in this schematic here in that um, these, it activates Th17 cells. IL-6 also involved in plasma blast stimulation and differentiation of macrophages. And so when you have satralizumab and tocilizumab, you're blocking all of these pathways here that are involved in the pathogenesis of NMO. And we also know from cytokine studies that in NMO, IL-6 is actually elevated in NMO. So again, provides evidence that if we block IL-6, it should be effective. Um, the benefit of satralizumab over tocilizumab is that it's modified so that um, it doesn't get degraded in endosomes um, as quickly. And so essentially what it allows is uh, treatment with subcutaneous satralizumab every four weeks compared to tocilizumab, where if you're doing subcutaneous, you need it every week. But they both block IL-6 and they're both effective for NMO. There is uh, two randomized clinical trials for satralizumab. One of them here is the Secure Sky Study, Sky Study and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see here that with satralizumab, there were some relapses, but it was significantly better than placebo. 20% of relapses on satralizumab compared to 43% on placebo. And it was especially effective for patients with acuporin 4 positive NMO, where it led to a 79% reduction in attacks. So if you've got a patient with NMOSD and they're seronegative, satralizumab may be not 
quite as effective, but if they're aquaform four positive, we think satralizumab is a very good option. So we've got our B cells, we've got our L6 inhibitors, and the last class of medications that was investigated is ecolizumab, or is a complement inhibitor, and the med first medication um, evaluated was ecolizumab. And this was a pretty exciting um, class of medications to investigate because it really stems on the fact that we understand the pathogenesis of NMO. We know that acuporin 4 antibodies are um, created by plasma cells. They get access to the brain through a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And essentially what complement does um, is that it leads to astrocytic destruction. And so again, the, one of the key pathogenesis within NMO is complement. And so the thought that a complement inhibitor would be effective in NMOSD was very intriguing. And it was uh, investigated in a study called the PREVENT study. And what ecolizumab does is it inhibits cleavage of C5, so it prevents the formation of membrane attack complexes uh, C5B, C9. And essentially what it does is it prevents this formation and prevents the secondary destruction of astrocytes and glia and neurons. And um, it was a very pivotal study, again, complete, um, published in 2019, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they had 96 um, patients treated with ecolizumab compared to, compared to 47 patients treated with placebo. With ecolizumab, it's an IV infusion every two weeks, so very frequent, um, frequent dosing. Um, but what it found was pretty striking. The top group here is the ecolizumab group compared to placebo. And you could see that only 3% of patients had a relapse on ecolizumab compared to 43% on placebo, leading to a 94% reduction in relapses. So as close to a cure as possible, very, very effective. Um, there were 21 patients who were treated with monotherapy and there were no relapses in that group compared to 54% of patients who were on placebo alone. Um, one important thing about ecolizumab is that, again, it inhibits complement, which is involved in clearing menin meningococcal infections. And so therefore, a meningococcal vaccination is required. In the ecolizumab trial, um, there were no cases of um, meningitis uh, but it's certainly a risk that can happen. These three clinical trials were all published in 2019, and the American Academy of Neurology actually called 2019 the year of NMO because we had this uh, really disabling disease, and we had three separate randomized clinical trials showing very effective reduction in relapses. More recently, just this year, we had uh, a more recent clinical trial um, looking at ravulizumab, which is very similar to ecolizumab, but except instead of a treatment every two weeks, it's a complement inhibitor that you have to treat every eight weeks, which would be obviously more convenient to the patient. This was a very interesting clinical trial because we now have FDA-approved medications showing that it, these medications work. So it's no longer ethical to actually have ravulizumab or, or any treatment against placebo because, again, that placebo group could de develop harm. So how this clinical trial worked is they took 58 patients that were treated with revulizumab, and they looked at relapses, and they compared it to the placebo group from the PREVENT trial. Um, so again, not putting patients at risk to be at placebo. And you can see here, this is the PREVENT study that we already saw. We saw that patients on placebo are going to have relapses over time. And what's amazing is that in the revulizumab group, um, they followed these patients for two years. There was not a single patient that had a relapse. And uh, essentially, they calculated a reduced relapse reduction of 98.6%. So again, as close to a near cure as possible um, with these treatments. Um, two patients did experience meningococcal infections. So these um, treatments are not without risk, but they are very exciting. So again, how do we approach patients with NMO? Uh, you're gonna treat them acutely with high-dose corticosteroids and plasma exchange, and all patients require chronic immunotherapy. And this is the list of medications that we discussed. And there's a lot of things that go into trying to decide what to do, including you know, how frequently is the dosing every six months versus every two weeks, 
And another big one that we have to factor into is cost. You know, echolizumab and revelizumab are incredibly expensive and they have potential side effects, including meningococcal infections. And so these are all things that factor in, but we have some amazing treatment options for this these once disabling and um, blinding condition. So for the next less than 10 minutes, we're going to talk briefly on the treatment of MOGAD, MOG antibody associated disease, starting off with the treatment of acute attacks. When we know about the features of MOGAD, what makes us think, you know, could this be MOG? Um, it's recurrent optic nerve about 50%. Unlike MS, it tends to be bilateral simultaneous and up to 50%. And a big tip off in terms of MOGAD versus Enemo and, and MS is they tend to cause more disc edema. You can see here, some patients even have peripapillary hemorrhages, which is something we almost never see in Enemo and Mo or MS. Uh, and MRI can also give you a hint. 50% of cases have this uh, profound enhancement that extends into orbit, uh, which we call perineal enhancement. And the outcomes, again, though, are better than NMO. They present with very severe vision loss, but only about 5 to 10% end up legally blind compared to about 50% for NMO. And they're often very steroid responsive, sometimes even steroid dependent. So let's talk about um, acute treatment. Well, a lot of what we need to know is just how, do, how does optic neurase present? Um, so we recently looked at 140 MOGAD optic neurise attacks. We had a lot of details in terms of how long they had pain, how long the vision dropped, and you know the outcomes. And on average, patients presented with three days of pain before the vision started dropping. On average, the vision dropped for about four days before reaching a pretty bad nadir of 2,600. And fortunately, the majority of patients recovered with only 5% of patients ending up 2,200 or worse. Well, because this patient uh, patients tend to drop for about four days, they've got three days of eye pain, could early treatment with steroids actually lead to better outcomes? And um, that's actually been reported by three separate retrospective studies suggesting, again, that early treatment within, uh, we found within two to three days leads to better outcome. These studies found within seven days, and this one found within nine days. Early treatment probably does lead to better outcomes. You know, MOGAD attacks tend to be very steroid responsive. Um, and so, again, in the acute setting, we're going to be treating with IV steroids. And because sometimes they're steroid dependent, we do an oral prednisone taper over one to two months. Um, so, again, early treatment may lead to better outcomes. We don't really follow the ONTT and give them the option of steroids or not. Really, we treat them right away. But it's important to note that spontaneous improvement can occur. We consider plasma exchange if it's severe and there's no recovery after high dose corticosteroids. Um, this is that schematic of the plex optic nourish broken by, by etiology. And you can see here that patients with MOGAD present with very severe vision loss and after plex had very, very good outcomes, even in fact, even better than NMOSD. And so if a patient has um, severe optic nourish from MOGAD and there's no recovery, we would recommend plex. Whereas NMO, we're doing plex and IV steroids right off the bat. So let's talk about chronic therapy now for MOGAD. Obviously, it's very different for, from MS and MOSD uh, because only 50% of patients relapse and recover from attacks is much better than NMO. Only patients with relapsing disease or severe disability from the first attack require chronic immunotherapy. So again, very different than MOSD where all patients require treatment and all MS patients require treatment. In terms of what treatment to do, really it's kind of based on retrospective studies. And I just highlighted the five largest studies to date. Um, I would just, I thought we could just go through our study, but they're all very, very similar um, in that um, they all kind of looked at the traditional medications used for NMO, looked at MS, and some studies are looking at IVIG. And they all talk about pre-treatment analyzed relapse rate and the treatment and the analyzed relapse rate on treatment. And first, um, all the studies show that MS medications are ineffective for MOGAD. You can see before treatment and after treatment, really no reduction in the analyzed relapse rate. The traditional medications for NMOSD, most of the studies are all showing that um, there is a reduction in analyzed relapse rate on treatment, but certainly not 100% relapse. You can still see that patients are relapsing on mycophenolate, azathioprine, and rituximab. And really, the treatment for MOGAD and NMO is not the same. Uh, this was a study done out of France where they found that uh, rituximab was very effective for NMO, just like all studies have shown. But a third of patients with MOGAD still relapsed despite having B-cell depletion. 
And so again, rituximab probably is a little bit effective for MOGAD, but certainly not nearly as good as it is for NMOSD. So not the treatments for MOGAD and NMO are completely different because the pathogenesis is different. One thing that we found, again, in this study, although only 10 patients, was a striking reduction in relapses on IVIG. And that's been found predominantly in a pediatric population that IVIG is very effective for MOGAD. So we recently did a large international multi-center retrospective study looking at adult MOGAD patients. And this was nine countries, 14 centers, and we found was a significant reduction in relapses with IVIG. You can see before IVIG, the media, median analyzed relapse rate was 1.4 attacks per year, so even more than one attack per year. And on IVIG, the median was zero. But a third of patients still relapsed, so it wasn't perfect. Um, when we looked at the uh, dosing of IVIG, you saw that we found that lower dose or less frequent dosing was associated with a higher relapse than higher dosing and more frequent IVIG dosing here in red. So again, it shows that um, IVIG probably is effective because any, med any medication that has a dose response curve is probably effective. The only drawback is the cost, one, and two, it's hard to know how much any particular patient needs because there were some patients that were quiet on low dose of IVIG. Um, the other exciting treatment for MOGAD is probably IL-6 inhibition, just like in NMOSD, uh, IL-6 inhibitors are probably affected in MOGAD. Um, this is a, a small retrospective study, but again, showing that on tocilizumab, there is a large reduction in relapses. And probably the most exciting thing are the randomized clinical trials that are currently enrolling. So one is satrolizumab, an IL-6 IL inhibitor, which again, was proven to be very effective in NMOSD. We think that based on retrospective studies that IL-6 inhibition will be effective for MOGAD. Again, cytokine studies show that MOGAD patients do have elevated levels of IL-6 during attacks. And so we do think satrolizumab will be effective. And the other randomized clinical trial currently enrolling is for rosanoliximab. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody that blocks neonatal FC receptors. And essentially what it does is it inhibits IgG recycling and it induces removal of pathogenic IgG on of antibodies. It's sort of like plasma exchange that you can do over and over again to kind of wash out these pathologic antibodies. And so I think these are very exciting um, treatment options that we need to explore th for two reasons. One, it can prove um, FDA approved medications for this disease. And two, even the placebo arm of these um, clinical trials will actually give us a lot of information on the natural history of MOGAD. And so really MOGAD is, is kind of following the footsteps of NMO where we've got near cures for that disease. I think we'll have the same for MOGAD very, very shortly. And so this is just kind of a summary of the chronic treatments. If a patient has relapsing disease for MOGAD, um, we have these treatment options, but IVIG and tocilizumab are probably the most effective. And of course, look out for those randomized clinical trials. If you have a patient that is a potential candidate, that means they've got relapsing disease within one year, um, try to get them enrolled in these clinical trials because I think they're, they're going to be very important. And I'd happy to answer any questions anyone might have right now. That was a wonderful talk, Doctor. So, Murli, can you take the questions and uh, some from the panel also? Yeah. Do you have any, uh, what, what information do you have, uh, Dr. Janchen? That was a very information uh, informative talk. Uh, but um, in case uh, some of these patients with MOGAD present late uh, or they are not treated, what is the natural history of untreated uh, MOGAD? Yeah, again, because only 50% of patients are going to relapse. We're not putting them on chronic in immunotherapy after they've got one attack. Uh, so yeah, we definitely have patients who you know, had an attack three years ago and they're here for follow-up and we check them for MOG antibodies and, and they're positive, but they went three years without a relapse. So we're not putting them on treatment right now. Uh, and, and so- Even without that, pulse steroids, even without pulse steroids, not treated with pulse steroids. Oh, okay. So you're saying they've got yeah, optic yeah, You're seeing them maybe like- Treated with uh, pulse steroids, either like uh, in the optic neuritis treatment trial, uh, they said uh, it doesn't really matter if you don't treat them. So any similar information we have for MOGED? Yeah. So again, if a patient has- you know, severe vision loss. We're treating them with IV steroids because they tend to be very steroid responsive, sometimes steroid dependent. 
Um, we don't really give them an option of observation. But if you're catching them late, let's say, you know, they had optic neuritis and they dropped the count fingers and they didn't get treated and they improved, uh, don't need to treat them at that point. Uh, you know, patients can have spontaneous improvement. In the optic neuritis treatment trial, there were three patients that were MOGAD. Uh, we retrospectively got a serum from them and checked to see how many of them were MOGAD. One of them actually dropped to hand motion, got randomized to placebo, and still recovered in 2020 on placebo. So again, they can recover without steroids. Of course, that patient had a lot of pallor, had a lot of visual field loss. So again, if you do have a patient with MOGAD presenting with pretty severe optic neuritis, we are recommending you know, pretty aggressive IV steroids. But again, they can recover without steroids. They can recover spontaneously. And for NMOSG, how, you said chronic treatment with immunomodulators is required. Uh, so how yeah. long? On a... <laughs> Essentially, on most people would say, going to be lifelong? you know, lifelong, you know, it, you know, very similar to MS, where, you know, it's it's just a very debilitating disease. John, may I ask a question? Um, of course. The first question is, how many people who were previously diagnosed with chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy <laughs> actually turned out to be uh, MOGAD um, that we know of? No, that's perfect. So some studies have suggested that up to 50% of, of cryon is, actually, is, is MOG. Uh, so again, a cryon by definition is chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. So it's that optic neuritis that's steroid responsive uh, mm -hmm. or steroid dependent, um, but it has to be idiopathic. But yeah, now we know that 50% of them are cryon. Uh, that means 50% are still some antibody we don't know, but at least we've chipped mm -hmm. off 50% of them. That's pretty good with one <laughs> antibody biomarker. Yeah. And my second question is again, along this line and uh, um, is... Uh, I have a patient who, let's just say, looks like MOGAD, smells like MOGAD, but um, very sterile responsive. But the NMO, uh, and, uh, sorry, the MOG antibody is negative, NMO is negative, very sterile responsive, but off steroid relapse again. So I'm calling it Creon at this stage. But yeah. my question to myself is, uh, is it worthwhile re repeating that um, MOG antibody? And if no, so, when? That's a great question. Um, yeah, again, at that point, if, if they're antibody negative and you root out circuit, I agree, it's Creon. But um, one, I would make sure, obviously, the MOG antibody is done uh, with a cell-based assay, which you know, I pretty much they all are. The live cell-based assays may have a little bit better sensitivity than the fixed cell-based assays. So I'd make sure it's actually a live cell-based assay if they've got a very good MOGAD phenotype and they're negative on the uh, on a fixed cell base assays. That's one thing I would do. And then some recent studies are suggesting that up to 11% of patients who are zero negative, so blood negative for MOG, actually will have isolated positivity in a CSF. And okay. so that's certainly an option as well, is to do okay. a lumbar puncture and check yeah. a CSF MOG. Um, that's higher okay. for ADEM and other phenotypes than optic neuritis, but still about 2 to 4% of optic neuritis might be explained by CSF MOG. So that's another Is option. And then, <laughs> and then again, lastly, there could still be an antibody. We just don't know. <laughs> I, and I was going to ask that question, as you can see, as you nicely illustrated, they behave differently. Say in Creon, what is your your treatment of choice? Do you use IL-6? Do you use azathioprine or mycophenolate in your Creon cases that is uh, antibody negative? Gosh, that's a good question. I think in the past, you know, it was probably your azathioprine, sosep, rituximab kind of mm. group just because we translate it to NMOSD, but I would say Creon acts more like MOGAD. So at this point, I would probably be leaning more toward um, IL-6 tocilizumab or maybe IVIG. Uh, just okay. again, I think the Creon cases, even if they're negative for MOG, still behave more like MOG than NMO. They do, don't they? It smells like yes. it, looks like it. It does, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, Thank you. So uh, thanks Dr. a lot. John, I have another question. Uh, some of these MOG patients... Uh, actually present with a raised uh, uh, CSF pressure. So <laughs> any, um, some of them, I mean, you had also spoken about it in one of the recent webinars. So any treatment differences? Uh... Uh, really, no, no treatment differences. I mean, first, you've got to figure out, you know, why it's raised. And usually, if it's, if it's raised just from the inflammation, if you treat the inflammation, it should go down. 
but then again, there's the chance you could have Hickam's dictum where you've got a patient log and they've got IIH. So then you've got to treat the IIH component. Um, but for the most part, it's more inflammatory. And so as long as you treat the inflammation, they should do it better. Yes, Madam Dr. Yeah. Ariji, uh, Sharma, sir, or Rohit, uh, Dr. Rohit, do you have any questions or comments? No, absolutely great, Doc. That was, that was highly illuminating. Fabulous. Wonderful. Okay. I just have a sh very short question. John, is there any, from all this data that you're collecting, is there any feel you get about this uh, NMO negative, mock negative, not MS-like optic neuritis? Uh, any feel about how or how best to treat this uh, very bland, all negative optic neuritis? Any data of that sort? You know, I think um, in the acute setting, if it's severe, you know, we're, we're treating with IV steroids um, because you don't know if they're going to be NMO or mock. Uh, so that's changed a little bit in that we don't really give them the option if it's severe. Uh, and then long term, you know, just like uh, Celia had mentioned, if they end up filing this Creon pattern, then we kind of treat them that way. Uh, okay. But if it's just a single attack, we just kind of wait and watch and hopefully they don't relapse again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, who is going to be talking on update on surgical management of paralytical strabismus. So, on to you, Doctor. Okay. Am I uh, audible? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chitra. I think it's a pleasure to be with such stalwarts on neuroophthalmology. My talk is more on the management of the strabismus part. And this is uh, what we are uh, following. There are no financial disclosures. There are three cranial nerves which are going to be, uh, I'll be discussing in this talk. And first comes the third nerve. And third nerve, as we know, affects uh, quite differently in different people. And first of all, it may be a pupil sparing. So although it's on uh, surgery, but yeah, always keep in mind that there may be some pupil sparing cases and you need to just investigate them and treat them as per their uh, systemic treatment is required. Some of them may require imaging also. Uh, so in management in third nerve palsy, we need to have a complete oculomotor diagnosis investigate the cause, a regular follow-up every six weeks, natural recovery may be there in six to nine months. If it's not, then only we go in for surgery. And for ptosis, you may not uh, able to do much except for crutch glasses. And when we are planning for surgery, always determine which is the fixating eye for the target deviation. So the basic algorithm is that, that whenever the eyes are passing through the midline, then we may get away with a recess reject procedure or a recess uh, plication nowadays. And this is uh, one of the options, which is very simple. So you may uh, have to do sometimes adjustable if they are more demanding and diplopia is going to be a, a question. And on the resection front, we may now switch on to plication of the uh, muscle instead of the resections. Uh, the plication surgery, I won't go because of shortage of time. Now we have some cases which I like to present. Now this individual who has a right third nerve palsy, uh, here, the difference that we have to notice is the LR recessions have to be large in cases of third nerve palsies. Uh, the standard limitations are not going to be concerned because they may have tight FDT. And so in this case, an LR recession of 24 millimeters along with an MR plication of 8 millimeters has given us the yielded, uh, the good results. Another case is there in which the FDT is mildly tight and the eye does not cross the midline. So... Uh, what do we do? We have another option which is getting more and more uh, common nowadays. That's the nasal transposition of the split lateral rectus and this uh, to the uh, medial side and that helps us in correcting. It may be added with a PTSO or a full tenotomy of the superior oblique uh, if required to have the full transposition done easily. The pseudotosis is there in some of the cases, which should also be uh, noted. And if that is there, you may have to cut, correct the hypotropia. Like in this case, which we can see that there was a nasal transposition done for the horizontal component. But because of the pseudotosis of the hypotropia, 
we have done the vertical muscles in the other eye. Now, this case 4 illustrates that if there is a very tight lateral rectus, what do we do? Uh, the supramaximal recessions cannot yield and the nasal transposition is not so easily done in such cases. So what we do is an LR periosteal anchor. That means we are fixing the lateral rectus to the periosteum to take away the lateral rectus force altogether and then uh, do a plication of the medial rectus or a resection of medial rectus. Uh, but if there are very, very severe tight lateral rectus, we may have to anchor the globe to the medial side. So these are the various options in uh, depending on the type of severity of the lateral rectus is there. Cases which have an aberrant regeneration of the lid, some of them may have no horizontal deviation in the primary position. It's only an aberrant regeneration. We need to counsel them. There is no specific treatment that we can do uh, for such cases. Cases which have a horizontal deviation, we may choose to do the contralateral recess reject or recess placation procedure and that helps in correcting the lid along with the horizontal deviation being corrected. So like this case 20 year old male presents and he shows that there is an aberrant regeneration in the left eye post traumatic third nerve palsy. So what we did was uh, contralateral that's the uh, other eye LR recession. Um, mind you, it's 15 millimeters of lateral rectus and MR placation of 8 millimeters. And we get not only the correction of the horizontal deviation, but also the ptosis gets corrected, at least in the primary position. Of course, in the down gaze, there would be a lid retraction. Cases which have uh, inferior division third nerve palsy alone may have to be treated differently. Like in this case, we find that we have modified inverse NAP procedure. A right lateral rectus reinserted the right inferior rectus. No recession of the lateral rectus done in this case because we want its uh, action to work in the uh, for the depression. And the medial rectus has been rejected to correct the exo deviation six millimeters and reinserted at the right inferior rectus. And this corrects both the horizontal deviation as well as improves the depression. Cases which may have a lateral incompetence. And we may choose to do the contralateral eye, a combo recess reject procedure or a Scott procedure to correct the lateral incompetence. So this is another example of a use of another new procedure that we do, the Scott procedure. And that's on the other eye to correct the lateral incompetence, which was, as you can see, uh, eight prisms in the dextro gaze and 35 prisms in the levo gaze and only 16 prisms in the primary position. Sometimes we get cases which have been operated elsewhere twice or uh, so and such cases may require exploration. Uh, we again do that large LR recessions may be done. It's very difficult if it's been already done, but that's what we need to explore and do it. And then the IR belly transfer, the modified Nishida, that means you use the inferior rectus uh, to Im improve the adduction can be done like in this case. So these are important points to remember for third nerve palsy. The deviation in primary position, fixing eye target deviation, look for incompetence, realistic goals to be set, counsel the patient. Uh, so the newer te uh, techniques which have come have helped us in improving the prospects of third nerve palsy. Coming to the lateral rectus palsy, again, there has been an evolution in the transposition procedures. There have been like a full dinner plate that we have uh, from partial tendon VRT to full tendon VRT to so single muscle SRT or IRT and then augmentation effect by resections by foster sutures or augmentation by cross action. And we can also add the uh, effect by antagonist MR recessions uh, or even a Botox in the uh, things. And we also have the option of the IR belly transfer or the superiorectus belly transfer. So these various options which have been there over the period of time have yielded good results in different cases and we can select accordingly. Uh, the problem with the uh, uh, cases which may be non-adjustable, we may add by using an adjustable suture. Uh, but cases like when we have a cross action yields us good control on the improving the vector force as well as giving an adjustable suture. Uh, Nishida's procedure or belly transfer, of course, is non-adjustable. And in such cases, what we try to do is the uh, medial rectus, the antagonist, is put on an adjustable suture if we want to have a diplopia free position. So this is what can be done and improve the prospects. Uh, review which was done uh, in RP Center Ames earlier, vertical rectus transposition procedures, a systematic review. Uh, basically, what we see is that the problems are many. 
the surgical options are done differently by different people and also the individual cases are different. So there cannot be a clear cut answer that which procedure is the best and we may have to choose till there is a, a definite answer. We may choose individually and different procedures. Coming to the fourth nerve palsy, the superior oblique palsy, uh, we uh, have uh, several options, of course, and the management options have been very clearly defined earlier by Phil Knapp uh, in this uh, diagrammatic classification. The most common surgery done is the inferior oblique recessions, and now we have uh, the addition of the stagers anterior positioning done in order to take care of um, three plus or four plus inferior oblique overactions. When the deviations are larger, we may have to add another muscle, and in this case, it may be a superior oblique uh, tuck. Sometimes if there is a class three, then we may uh, do the superiorectus FDT and if that is tight, a recession of the superiorectus will have to be done or a contralateral inferiorectus if there is no tight superiorectus. So the options are inferior oblique weakening, superior oblique tucking if the SO is lax, especially superiorectus recession if SR is uh, tight uh, on the force duction and the contralateral inferiorectus recession if uh, we find that there is the, the diplopia most in the down gazes. And if we want to strengthen the superior obliques, particularly in bilateral superior oblique palsies, we may uh, do a hara This is an anterior positioning in which. So the stages anterior nasal transposition. And uh, this is a procedure which may yield much good results. I think we may not have the time for the video. Uh, the superior oblique bilateral palsies, we should keep in mind if there is a history of head trauma. Subjective complaints of torsion, objective torsion more than 10 degrees, alternating hypertropia on alternating head tilt test, and usually a V pattern with the ESO in down gaze. And that's why the person keeps a, uh, a like a bull in the china shop head posture. That means it is chin down. And that is a case in which we may do a modified Harada Ito, uh, in which we advance the anterior fibers. To the lateral rectus. Uh, recently, uh, Dr. Jonathan Holmes is suggesting that we may do a resection of this part of the uh, superior oblique fibers instead of an advancement. So these are the various options and uh, we need to see that uh, what is the kind of case uh, our uh, is having a problem and we can tackle them if we think uh, in squint intellectually and correct the individual case. Uh, I think thank you so much for that, for this. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Uh, Pradeep Sharma. That was, again, a very illuminating talk. Um, do you feel there's any role of uh, Botox in uh, temporary period in paralytic establishments or no role at all? Yeah, particularly the six nerve palsies, which we have seen for uh, four weeks not recovering, and if they are non, uh, not having an ischemic problem, mostly because the ischemic problems recover by four to six weeks and they show recovery. In those cases, we avoid using Botox. But those cases so which are not recovering, Botox can be injected in the medial rectus. We have to be careful that uh, we do not uh, use too much of uh, more than, I mean, uh, five units sometimes may be required in older children, people, but there may be a risk of ptosis, which may be another problem. So we have to be careful in that. But yeah, Botox does have a role for temporizing cases. In the meantime that the recovery happens, we can use Botox. Thank you, Murli. Uh, sir, it's always a pleasure listening to you, sir. I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, sir, the lateral rectus recession of 25 millimeter that you said, uh, it is on a hangback, sir. Bite at it. So it's not a full hangback. Whenever we do these, uh, large recessions on a hangback, uh, the rule is that we should not hang, free hang more than 7 millimeters. So it, if you have to do 25, you'll do like 18 plus 7. So you do as much as possible on the sclera. And then the rest, which we are not able to reach, that part is left to hang back uh, because there would be a problem of creeping forward and losing the effect over a period of time. A full hang back should be avoided for large recessions. And so for bilateral acquired superior oblique pulses uh, with the arrow pattern isotropia, uh, do you feel bilateral inferior rectus recession has a Would you still stick to haradite too? Yeah, I personally feel that if there is a torsion, which is the uh, main problem, and that's what th is there mostly in the bilateral suprablic palsies, the vertical deviation is not so much of a problem because it gets neutralized by the other side. So if the torsion is a main problem, the it would be better corrected by uh, tackling an oblique muscle because the obliques are the primary uh, totters rather than the inferior rectus. So my choice always is if, if there is a torsion, which we have to correct, use the obliques. 
And if it's only a vertical deviation, which is left over, then the inferior rectus can be used as a second muscle. Okay, sir. So we'll go on to our next speaker. Uh, uh, we'll call on Dr. Rashmin Gandhi to talk on diagnosing and managing non-organic vision loss. On to you, Dr. Rashmin. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's always a, a great pleasure to be part of these events which are curated by Dr. Chitra and Dr. Muti. And I'm going to talk about uh, non-organic vision loss. Uh, a patient can come to us with problems which may not be related to any known disorders. It can be of efferent system where he can be talking about total blindness, which can be binocular or monocular, diminution a diminished vision, which can again be binocular or monocular, visual field defects or night blindness. There are times where patient can come with a non-organic symptoms of diplopia, voluntary nystagmus, gaze palsy, uh, blepharospasm, hemifacial spasm, and whatnot. We'll uh, be talking only about the visual system problem. So let's start with a person who comes to you with a monocular profound loss of vision. The steps involved would be to have a complete ocular and neurological examination done. Now, if you find at the end of this examination that symptoms are out of proportion to known disease pattern and the science cannot really explain the symptoms is where we resort to our main meat of uh, uh, our examination, which is Fritz and ancillary tests in these patients with non-organic vision loss. So pointers to a non-organic vision loss in somebody who has a unilateral blindness would be absence of RAPD with no ocular cause for loss of vision. We resort to tricks. Uh, basically, we are trying to trick somebody who is trying to trick us. Uh, what are the tricks that can be deployed in patient with monocular blindness? Now, uh, you have the trial frame on the patient. You can fog either a good eye by putting a very high powered plus 10, plus 7, plus 8, or a minus 7 uh, in front of the good eye and let the patient uh, believe that he is seeing through the good eye or also place a uh, occluder or a pinhole and keep changing occluder and pinhole in front of the good eye and the bad eye. These movements have to be fast because a lot of these patients keep checking whether which eye you are testing. So if you can keep doing occluder in front of a good eye and a pinhole in front of the eye where he says that he cannot see anything, quickly keep changing. Sometimes he would be uh, fooled into reading through a pinhole, which is in front of the eye, which, in which he says he cannot see anything. Uh, Vort Fodder test or Diochrome test, the principle is that you put uh, a red uh, and green uh, glasses in front of the, the eyes and let him uh, read or see the dots. Now, uh, eye in front of which has a red filter, it can see only the red uh, color and the green filter can see only the green. So if he's able to see everything, if he's able to read both the lines of diochrome, then we know that the eye which he says he cannot see actually has some vision. Stereopsis, again, is another important pointer towards having a binocular vision. Prisms, we can, there are various ways by which you can use prisms in somebody who has a monocular blindness. It can be a tend after base out prism in front of the non-seeing eye. If the vision loss is non-organic, a uh, patient would uh, display a movement towards the apex of the prism, or you can place an eight prism diopter in front of the affected eye and ask the patient to do uh, activity which requires a good binocular vision, like climbing up or down the stairs, or a four diopter prism held over a non-affected eye and ask the patient to read the lines in the Snellens. Organic monocular vision loss, patient will see only one line, but in a non-organic vision loss, if somebody who has a normal eye, they, they will be seeing two lines. So, I mean, uh, and how do you manage somebody who has this kind of monocular profound loss of vision as it happened in this 10 year old student who uh, wanted to bunk his exam uh, and his visual activity was two by 60 and with no, uh, the examination pointed no obvious pathology. Uh, they were counseled, they were given artificial tears and patient was told that if artificial tears does not treat the problem then you might just have to give a lot of injectables and the next vision came six by six. So that's monocular blindness. What about somebody who says that he cannot see with both the eyes? Bilateral blindness, how would you know that this is more likely to be a non-organic vision loss? 
again, pupils will be a, a good pointer where a bilateral blindness with sluggishly reactive pupil uh, versus a normal pupil, a normal briskly reacting pupil, uh, generally it can be a retrochiasmal disease which can be ruled out by doing MRI. And once MRI is normal, you know that in all likelihood you're looking at a non-organ vision loss in the presence of normal retina. Uh, how do you trick this patient? Patient would be able to move in unfamiliar surrounding. There was this very interesting paper by uh, American group, Nancy Newman and group. They said that patients who find this binocular blindness are more likely to be wearing sunglasses while uh, sitting in a, in a in OPD. Uh, a menace or a bright light or obscene words which will provoke response when you quickly put these in front of the patient's eye. There are tests based on proprioception, like asking patient to touch the nose or connect two fingers, which he should be able to do even in the absence of vision. Uh, but these patients would, uh, would try not to connect the fingers. Ask him to sign and even patients who are completely blind would be able to make a good signature. Optopanic nystagmus or mirror test, where uh, optopanic nystagmus would elicit a response in somebody who has a useful vision. A mirror test where you, you, you rotate mirror in front of uh, the patient and patient would have an nystagmus movement if he has a vision uh, in both the eyes. So that's about binocular profound loss of vision. What about somebody who says that just a blurring, not really blindness? Uh, here, the pointer to a, would be sy symptoms which are out of proportion and does not conform to a known pattern. These patients, binocular, blurring of vision, there are a Snellen's chart which are available, which you can keep playing around to, to really trick the patient in reading, which he did not read initially, like changing the distance, changing the size of the optotype. Uh, again, there are, there are these statistical um, uh, tests, which I have never used, but where you, uh, you have a patient look at the, the Landol C, and there is a possibility that patient would choose exactly the opposite direction of Landol C if he's finding uh, the blurring of vision. What about monocular blurring of vision? People, again, would be a good pointer in this patient saying that, well, this patient is not likely to have any optic nerve or anterior visual pathway disease. Stereopsis, monocular vertical prism dissociation test, or a fogging would be, again, a good, good help uh, to trick these patients. So that's about the vision loss, either monocular, binocular, profound, or mild. What about visual fields? There are patients who may say that they cannot see in the sight, but uh, in, in reality, their visual fields are normal. More often than not, these are the kind of uh, uh, responses that you'll find, especially on Goldman, spiraling of the uh, isopters, crossing isopters, star sept uh, uh, fields, and uh, these patients generally, when you go, when you do these either germ screening or visual field testing at different distances, they would have tunneling of the visual field except a funneling. Uh, in in patient with an uh, organic visual field loss, as you move away from the patient, there will be a little expansion of visual field. But the patient with a non-organic visual field loss would continue to have a tunnel vision. This is the example of a typical visual field generally in patient who has a non-organic disease. I would like to highlight, although uh, by presenting a case, uh, this is a 45-year-old female who was seen in 2011. She presented the gradually progressive loss of vision in both the eyes, and visual acuity was quite poor, like 2 by 60 in one eye and counting fingers in the other eye. Uh, there was no really ocular examination or a neuroaphthalmic examination did not really point towards any problem that she might be having. She was married to a type A personality who was very active in politics and uh, uh, and the husband kept saying that she just likes to shut herself in dark room and sulk. She had gone around the town and uh, a lot of, of the teams had told her that this is more likely to be a non-organic vision loss. The pointers at that point when she was first examined were symptoms out of proportion. She was easily navigating in OPD while waiting all, I mean, though her vision was poor, was wearing sunglasses. She recognized the optometrist at, at a five or six meter distance. So what next? We did uh, MRI brain, we repeated MRI brain uh, orbit, which was normal. ERG, VP, multifocal ERG at that point was normal. So patient was prescribed artificial tears. Next follow up, uh, a year later, everything was the same, except uh, patient said that she had little more difficulty in bright light than the last year. Uh, again, the, the electrophysiological test 
was not really remarkable. Few years later, uh, I mean, during this period, patient's husband had sent me a Facebook uh, friend request and I, I accepted it. And few years later uh, on the Facebook, I saw that uh, the husband has left uh, politics and now I saw a lot of photographs of the family uh, enjoying and going out of vacation. So I was a little curious because uh, entire history of the patient was blamed on husband being a little more dominating. So uh, we, we requested her to say, can you come back and see what's going on? So she came back in 2015. Her visual activity actually was still the same. And husband said that she still just likes to stay in a dark room. Pupils were brisk. At this point, we thought maybe we saw a, a RAPD. We, we did the VEP and uh, VEP actually showed a little bit of uh, reduction in amplitude and on flash VEP. However, now, as you can see here, the ERG had a maximal effect. The ERG waves forms had diminished by now. So here is a patient in her 40s who apparently uh, were uh, was having problems which are non-organic, but uh, over a period of two, three years now, the ERG started showing a problem. Fundus and MRI were still uh, still not very, they were okay. Uh, patient went around a few of the other groups and then we took an opinion from a retina group and they thought that maybe patient was suffering from Azure. So, highlight of this case is that while uh, some of the patient may look like or may even be proven to have a non-organ vision loss, they still need to have a regular follow-up because sometimes they might be harboring something which might become apparent later. So uh, what is Azure? I mean, that's what the other team thought that this patient might be having. Azure generally it affects women of young to middle age. 33% of these patients would continue to have normal examinations while some of them may show RP changes or decreased vision. Uh, so uh, to conclude, while non-organ vision loss uh, is something which sometimes you can be tricked uh, and patient can now uh, have uh, go on internet and see as to what are the signs that they should find. However, these are the organic conditions that are often misdiagnosed as functional vision loss like pituitary tumors, LHO, and we heard about it from uh, cilia, bilateral retrochasmal disease because pupils will be normal in those. Early cone dystrophy where retina may be normal. Retroverbal optic neuropathy sometimes can be uh, can be misdiagnosed as optic neuropathy. However, in these, generally, you will pupil will be a clue. CAR or MR, and we'll hear about some of these uh, in the next talk, or a small occipital infarct. So in other words, there are ways by which you can conclude uh, or you can diagnose patients with a non-organ vision loss. However, one has to give a maximum benefit of doubt to the patient before we resort to a diagnosis of non-organic vision loss. This is an algorithm which we published uh, in 2014 as somebody who has a functional vision loss. It can be by binocular profound process, monocular process, decrease in vision or a field loss. And uh, we have summarized here as to what are the pointers towards a, a functional or a non-organic vision loss. I thank you once again for your very kind invitation. Thank you. Very interesting talk, as always, Dr. Rashmin. It's so enjoyable. Um, mm -hmm. How reliable is a visual evoke potential in diagnosing a non-organic vision loss? So, uh, a pattern, uh, so there are two, flash and pattern visual evoke. Now, uh, the pattern VEP, patient can still defocus and can fool the machine. While it is very difficult to have, uh, uh, to find a flash VEP. So, yes, a pattern VP sometimes you may get a, a response which patient is simply not looking at the pattern and so you may have a waveform which which may not be a very good waveform. So flash VP will give you a very reasonable response because if somebody who says there's no PL but the waveforms are present, it's likely to be uh, non on Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it was a wonderful talk and this is as we have been always uh, listening that it is your wits versus the patient's wits. <laughs> so uh, malingering is like that. Nowadays because of the Google I think we have started getting cases which are still more intriguing like palinopsias and visual snow. Uh, I don't know uh, how to deal with them because sometimes we have no uh, clue. I mean they say it's there and nothing is uh, very anything that we can confirm. Because there may be really some visual snow 
or it may be just that they have read it on the Google and now they are pretending that way. Or uh, even the palinopsias, I mean, these after images which are prolonged, they keep on complaining. And they go from one doctor to the other and they're always under uh, stress. So any any clues from the panel? And in fact, uh, before, before we go to the panel, there has been a reverse part as well. If somebody who has a color vision but does not want to fail the color vision test, they just mug up the HTR chart because they know that that's what you're going to test on and they know the sequence. So that's why sometimes you go backward or start from the middle and go back and forth because otherwise they will try to trick you by knowing what, what comes next. Correct. Or they may use a contact lens which is having a red filter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Umapati, who's going to be talking on paraneuroplastic syndromes of relevance to neuroophthalmology. So on to you, doctor. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please bear with me um, because I'm actually <clears throat> speaking from a, a quite a remote region in uh, Pakistan. So I'm, I'm just wondering well, if there's any problems with the Wi-Fi, please forgive me. I'll try to log on as soon as I can. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the organizers for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to all the talks before me and I'm look, looking forward to the rest of the illuminating week uh, night. Um, uh, on my part, I'm just going to share with you a series of cases with interesting neuro-ophthalmological uh, signs of uh, paraneoplastic disorders. So first and foremost, I'll start with this patient whom I saw a few months ago. She came to the hospital. Uh, actually, as it always happens over a weekend, and she was admitted on a weekend with a complaint that she has been having uh, fatigue uh, over a period of months associated with uh, some ocular symptoms. So the question of myasthenia came up. And on examination, she did have proximal weakness and she did have uh, very mild ptosis, but the fatigability of the ptosis was, um, was uh, very equivocal. So uh, we were not quite sure, but there was an examination that was very illuminating. So as you can see, this lady uh, has got mild proximal weakness, but she had disproportionate uh, loss of reflexes. And very remarkably, after a short period of exercise, the uh, reflexes come back quite marvelously. So clearly, this is a, a classic sign of a post tetanic facilitation that we can see at the bedside for lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. So with this, um, let me just show it to you in another muscle for those of you couldn't appreciate it because sometimes the because of the poor Wi-Fi connection, the videos may be a bit laggy. So the ankle reflex, just like the knee reflex, was diminished. And after a period of exercise, uh, please bear with me if there's some background noise because I'm not in really in a uh, in a very quiet place. So please bear with me. Um, okay. So after the exercise, you can see the ankle jerk comes back very nicely. So with this suspicion, we went on to do. Uh, further testing, we went on to do an electrical test, which is basically a uh, simulation of the same thing, but using electrical currents, where we exercise the patient and stimulate the nerve before and after exercise. And there was a significant increment in the compound muscle action potential. We went on to show the presence of a, a voltage-gated calcium channel antibody. And with this, uh, we were highly suspicious of an underlying malignancy. So a systemic workup revealed that she did indeed have small cell cancer, which was at that point still asymptomatic. So I think this is an important point about paraneoplastic syndrome. Often the manifestation occurs when the cancer is in a relatively benign stage. 
or really, I, I should say benign, relatively uh, a nascent stage where the, the putative uh, disimmune process is probably keeping the neoplastic process under control. So it behooves us as clinicians to understand the paraneoplastic disorder, search very hard and find the cancer so that early treatment can be instituted. Let me go on to another patient. So I think many of the seniors in the audience are able to recognize this disorder right away. But for the juniors in the audience, and this is what I call the still point in the turning world moment. Whenever I see a patient with such complex disorders, my heart uh, pauses for a moment and uh, trying to get hold of what's happening. So this is when I have to think about some of the aids that were taught to me so to facilitate uh, diagnosis of such patients. So one of them is this particular chart that Dr. Z always advocates. So whenever you see spontaneous eye movement, always ask yourself, what is happening that's taking the eye away from rest? As you know, the eyes only have two basic functions. It's supposed to stay put when it's supposed to stay put. And the second function is when it's supposed to go somewhere else, it's supposed to go somewhere else properly. So in this particular case, it's obviously the first problem. It's not staying put. So if it's not staying put, the first question you have to ask ourselves is, what is taking it away? If it's a slow phase that is taking it away, it's a nystagmus. But as you can see in this picture, what is taking the eye away from a rest position is not a slow phase, but a fast phase. Okay. So once you get a fast phase problem, then we know that we are not dealing with nystagmus, but we are dealing with a saccadic abnormality. Then once we have decided it's a saccadic abnormality, then the next question to ask ourselves is, what happens between saccades? Is there a pause or there's no pause? So what do you think? So often it's useful to look at the eyelids also because the eyelids tend to mimic the uh, eye movements. So as you can see, between saccades, there is hardly a pause. And sometimes I tell my residents, it's, it's good to imitate, try to imitate the eye movements with sound. So this would be a sort of movement, right? So it doesn't have a movement. So if that was, if there was a letter problem, then we clearly know that it's a saccade interfered by an intersaccadic interval. So that's when you have to think about square wave and all the other abnormalities. So in this particular case, is sort of movement, right? So that is when you will have to go to the right side of the equation. So a saccadic abnormality without intersaccadic intervals will be some sort of obsoclonus ocular flutter like Ill, um, disorder. So obsoclonus is multiple axis, ocular flutter is occurring in one axis. So in this case, obviously, this patient has it in multiple axis. So it's obsoclonus. And as you can see in the picture of his limbs, it's associated with myoclonus. So he satisfies criteria for the obsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So as far as obsoclonus myoclonus syndrome is concerned, there are three big groups. One is the paraneoplastic disorders which is the topic of today. Uh, it can also follow a viral infection. And of course, there is an ever-expanding list of infections, medications, and other disorders that are associated with obsoclonus myoclonus. So in children, again, we have to think about a tumor. We have to think about neuroblastoma specifically. In this particular case, it wasn't neuroblastoma. It was a post-viral obsoclonus myoclonus. Again, for children, you have to just be very patient and sit there and watch for a long period of time as she's engaging in play. And you can see, occasionally, her eyes will be fluttering away. And her limbs are also having this myoclonic jerks. She had post-viral obsoclonus myoclonus and responded very well to immunoglobulins. Okay. Now, if you want to understand uh, the pathophysiology of obsoclonus myoclonus, this is probably the best paper. It's basically got to do with the channels that are dysfunctional in the so-called omnipause neurons. So in eye movements, we're always talking about excitatory neurons. But for every excitatory neurons, there must be inhibitory neurons that are keeping everything under control. 
And these come under the big umbrella term of omnipause neurons. So when the channels in these omnipause neurons are abnormal, then these patients develop obsoclonus myoclonus like syndromes. Now, as I alluded to earlier, if the obsoclonus myoclonus does not occur in multiple axes and occurs in one axis, then we call it ocular flutter. But as far as the disease process is concerned, it is the same pathophysiology. Therefore, the etiologies are the same. So we have to look for paraneoplastic, post-infectious, as well as the long list of causes that I uh, listed out earlier. So this is a patient where a long period of observation, patient observation was very useful because he has very short episodes of flutters. And this was very useful. I'll just play it again. Because this is a patient who had COVID encephalitis, uh, and it, there was a question of whether it was really COVID-related encephalitis or was it a metabolic syndrome. But the presence of a disimmune process like ocular flutter made us uh, think of an immune process and we started treating him with, uh, with immunomodulatory drugs and the patient responded very well. So I think this is one of the lessons that we have learned during the, the COVID pandemic, that a patient with COVID after recovery seems to be more encephalopathic than he should be. The presence of ocular flutter or any other psychotic abnormalities points towards a specific post-infectious inflammatory process and these patients respond well to inflammatory treatment. Let's change gears again and go to another patient. This is a 51-year-old lady who came to us with a three-month history of progressive worsening diplopia, ataxia, nausea, vertigo, and gait difficulties. I'm going to start off with the, the part of the eye movements that are, that are relatively normal, vertical saccades. And I want you to see how fast they are. As you know, for saccades, we give two objects. In the case of vertical saccades, we give an object high up and an object low down, and we ask the patient to look up and down very quickly. A normal saccade is defined as the eye disappearing at its onset and appearing at the final point. If you see the eyes moving slowly okay, between the two objects, then it's a slow saccade. So you can see clearly here that this lady's vertical saccades are fast. Tup, 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 tup. As I alluded to earlier, it's good to mimic the sound of eye movements with sound. Sorry, the, uh, mimic the pattern of eye movements with sound. So it just goes tup, 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 tup vertically. But when she does horizontal movements, you can see it's almost like it's moving through treacle, like a creaking draw, you know. Again, I'm going to give some sound effects. Very, very slow. And almost like magic, you can see in comparison, the vertical saccades are super normal. And not all horizontal movements are equally affected. When I change gears and tested a different system, you can see that a convergence is so much better. So this seems to be a very specific saccadic abnormality, specifically affecting the horizontal saccadic abnormalities. So obviously this localizes to the pons, okay, involving the PPRF on both sides. So we expected a lesion in the pons because we think that this patient has some form of brainstem pathology and we expected a lesion in the pons. But surprisingly, the MRI was normal and even the spinal tab was normal. Now, as we have alluded to in the past talks, I think Dr. Miller likes to say this quite often. Now, what is present in a patient is often very important for us. But in many instances, what is also not present is important. So this is the famous, the dog that did not bark in the night principle. So I think some of you know the story. In this particular case, the fact that the dog did not bark, the dog that was present in the crime scene did not bark in the quiet of the night, prompted Sherlock Holmes to narrow down the suspects to three suspects who obviously knew the dog and that's why the dog did not bark and uh, find the suspect for this crime in this story called The Silver Blaze. So this is an important story that illustrates that for clinicians, what is present is as important as what is not present or vice versa. So in this case, the normal... MRI is also useful because it kind of rules out neoplastic and vascular causes. 
And obviously, the time span of this illness over a period of three months rules out genetic and congenital disorders. She did not have any metabolic problems like hypernatremia or anything to suggest osmotic injury. She did not have a long progressive history to suggest the degenerative process. And she wasn't exposed to any toxins. And uh, nevertheless, uh, because she had some vomiting, we gave her time in, in case this manifestation was uh, a footprint of some time in deficiency, uh, a form fruits of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Then we went on to investigate further for possible inflammatory and paraneoplastic disorder. And lo and behold, further review showed that she did indeed have some systemic symptoms. She had uh, evidence of carcinoma of the breast with metastatic disease. Further worked up, work up it indicated the histopathological and genetic subtype. And lo and behold, a paraneoplastic antibody test came back positive for anti re antibody, which is a classic antibody associated with brainstem encephalitis. So, a saccadic abnormality. So, a saccadic abnormalities are clearly related to this brainstem encephalitis from anti re antibodies. Now, uh, we did not have follow up on this patient uh, because she went back to a home country for further treatment of a cancer and a paraplanoplastic disorder. La last patient is a similar patient, 81 year old lady who comes in with acute vertigo. Okay, as you can see, the only phys physical finding of importance is the skew deviation as well as a nystagmus that's torsional in nature. So many of us are familiar that when we see a patient with an acute vestibular syndrome, the differential diagnosis is between acute vestibular neuronitis and a posterior circulation stroke. And one of the things that helps us delineate between the two is so the so-called HIMS protocol. The presence of a HIMS impulse, the presence of a nystagmus of a peripheral nature, and the absence of a skew will point towards a peripheral vestibular pathology. In our patient, it was just the reverse. A head impulse was negative, her nystagmus was torsional, which is definitely not peripheral in nature, and she had a presence of a skew. So with that, even though the MRI was normal, we were very suspicious of a central nervous system disorder. So the patient wasn't discharged and kept in the ward, and she obliged us by developing other symptoms over the next few days. As you can see in the picture, in addition to the slurred speech, she had very prominent downbeat nystagmus. And in addition to that, she also developed another brainstem sign, ocular bobbing. So we repeated the MRI, again, normal. And again, just like the other case, we started thinking about uh, pathology that can be uh, that can be invisible on an MRI. So with that, we went ahead and did a paraneoplastic workup and an anti-U antibody was positive. That prompted uh, extensive malignancy workup and an underlying malignancy was discovered. And uh, unfortunately for this lady, despite aggressive treatment of the cancer, and immunotherapy, she progressed neurologically and did not do well. Finally, a patient with hypertension who came to see us for subacute diplopia consistent with a right six nerve palsy. This lady I actually saw in Arvind. So let me play a video. <laughs> So she clearly has a right six nerve palsy. She is a hypertensive, hypertensive. So she was sent to us as a vasculopath. But there was something just not right about her. One of them was in the ear. What was wrong with the ear? The car is attacked okay, over the side. Okay, right inside the ear. Okay, so I'm not testing hearing in the ear. I'm actually testing the sensation in the external canal. She can feel very well on the left ear. But on the right ear, she lost sensation. She lost sensation in the external canal. What is that? 
This is known as the Hindelberger sign. Now, as we all remember from anatomy day, seventh nerve is almost exclusively a motor nerve. But there is a puny little sensory nerve in the seventh nerve. And that is the, the nerve that is responsible for somatic sensation in the external canal of our ear. Okay, and that's the part where we, we feel when we are cleaning our ears. So that is the only part that has sensation as far as the seventh nerve is concerned. And that's the reason why in Ramsey Hunt syndrome, the only place the vesicles can occur is in the external canal. So now this particular sensory nerve is actually very close to the internal acoustic meatus. So a lesion in the internal acoustic meatus, like a CP angle tumor, like an acoustic neuroma, often presses on this particular sensory nerve. So even before the facial nerve is affected, like in this patient, she doesn't really have a facial nerve lesion, but the sensory part is affected. This points towards a partial seventh nerve lesion that's only affecting the sensory branch near the internal acoustic meatus. And this, this is known as the Hilton Berger sign. So with that, we went on to examine her more carefully and detected. Huh? Right sensory neural deafness. So in summary, she's got a right sixth nerve palsy. She has got a very mild seventh nerve palsy only affecting the internal acoustic meatus. She's got eight nerve palsy. And some of the astute clinicians in the audience would have noticed that she actually has a Brun's nystagmus that's kind of masked by the sixth nerve palsy. So with that, we localize a pathology to the base of the skull near the cerebellar pontine angle. This is a lady from an underserved region, but we ensured that uh, in spite of the lack of resources, she goes and gets a scan. And unfortunately for her, the scan showed a, a glomus jugulari tumor. Now, why do I end off with this? Today's talk was supposed to be on paraneoplastic manifestations of cancers. While we are talking about paraneoplastic and uh, manifestations of cancers, which are important, we mustn't forget the direct neoplastic consequences of cancers in as far as the neuro-ophthalmological system is concerned. So this is a patient who has got neuro-ophthalmological manifestation by the direct effect of the cancer rather than an indirect effect of the cancer. So in summary, cancers can affect the eyes by directly through uh, the effect of cancer or indirectly through an immunological process. And with the four cases, I've given you a flavor of the different type of syndromes that are maybe not as common as other neurological disorders are concerned, but relatively important from the point of view of detecting the cancers early and affording good treatment for these patients. Thank you very much for your attention uh, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk, doctor. Very nice. Okay. Very interesting. Murli? Uh, yeah, Dr. Mapati, thank you uh, very much. I mean, a uh, question which uh, Madam also wanted to ask and uh, uh, Dr. Ambika has also uh, put in the chat box. Uh, would you consider a panel of uh, paraneoplastic antibodies or is it syndrome specific? Like for this syndrome, you would do this antibody. For rhomboencephalitis, you would do this. For ocular flutter, you would do the other. Anything of that sort? Okay, I must uh, confess that I started off uh, being a conservative person. I started off being very dogmatic and thinking about the type of cancer and the type of syndrome and then matchmaking them and deciding which antibody to do. But I've been proven so many times uh, by colleagues when they order a panel and, and, and the panel comes back positive in an unexpected manner. And in many laboratories, the cost of the panel is as much as the cost of a single test. So now I'm, uh, I'm kind of uh, ambivalent about it. I, I still feel that it's good for us from an academic point of view to think about what type of cancers and uh, are we are expecting for that syndrome. Because sometimes, you know, for example, if you see a patient with optimus myoclonus, a patient has carcinoma of the colon. I would not stop there because we know carcinoma of the colon is firstly very common. Secondly, we know carcinoma of the colon is not often associated with paraneoplastic syndrome. So I would still go and look for a classic cancer like breast cancer or lung cancer that is associated with that. So I've, I still kind of follow that principle, but I've kind of modified it 
to think about what type of answers I'm getting from the panel and what type of cancers I'm finding and whether it's consistent so that I don't miss the actual culprit and don't label it on uh, epiphenomenon. That means I'm finding a, a second cancer in a patient that may not be the cause for the paraneoplastic syndrome. So I think it's good to do the panel, but it's also good to understand the relationship between the panel, the antibody, as well as the, the syndrome so that we can uh, correctly attribute blame. Uh, how do you go around hunting for the uh, primary? I mean, would you recommend a whole body uh, CT scan in a male, including uh, the um, including the testes, or would you recommend a PET scan? I think in resource limited setting, we often start off with uh, a good uh, system review and a very thorough clinical exam, which includes breast examination and uh, pelvic examination in females and testicular examination for males. And thanks for all highlighting it because often. The testicular examination is ignored. Uh, and then for Caucasian patients, it's a very, very thorough examination of the skin because melanomas and skin cancers can be difficult to detect, especially if they are occurring at the hairline or behind the ear. Then beyond that, um, then we may want to do focus evaluation. Uh, in, a limo in, a, in a resource, unlimited sort of setting in a, in a developed country, I think it's good to uh, follow this up with a PET scan because it does shorten the diagnostic process and directs your attention towards uh, areas that are likely to have the malignancy. And it's often easier to uh, to rule out because, you know, as you as, as, as I alluded to earlier, some of these paraneoplastic syndromes are, are, are also seen in immunological, pure immunological disorders. So sometimes um, you see Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome as a pure immune phenomenon. So therefore, they don't have a malignancy. So in these particular cases, a negative PET scan repeated over a period of time gives you the reassurance that we are not missing a cancer. So I think uh, a PET scan is good, but in a resource-limited setting, we may have to uh, modify our approach accordingly. Uh, is it true that uh, these paraneoplastic conditions may predate the uh, malignancy by many years? I mean, do we have yes, to keep yes, hunting for them yes. and keep a watch out Absolutely. for them? Absolutely. Just like all the cases I've shown you, in fact, they manifested to us as neurological symptoms first. And, and I think the theory is that the immune process is actually keeping the cancer at check. So, um, so, so it, it, but how long, uh, that's a bit tricky because uh, um, uh, whether a cancer can be hidden for so many years, uh, we don't know that. Uh, in my experience, I think uh, we are talking about months rather than years between the manifestation, the neurological manifestation and the detection of cancer. Uh, Doctor? Yes. Ambika, you had a question. I mean, you put it in the chat box. Okay, the question uh, that Dr. Ambika wants Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Uh, great talk, Dr. Uma. Thank Which you. Which antibodies you. have you seen commonly associated with paraneoplastic optic neuropathies? and cancer-associated retinopathies, my first question. Second question is, if you have found the malignancy and treated that, do you see the disease process ending with it or it's still worse? Okay. Um, as far as paraneoplastic antibody is concerned, I, I, I may, uh, my memory may, may not serve me very well, but as far as optic neuritis is concerned, it, it's, I, if I'm not wrong, it's CRMP5. Please correct me, the others in the audience. And um, and and I'm also blocking on the CAR antibody. Um, I, I, because I, I'm sometimes blocking. we end up seeing like antibodies like enolase and uh, yes. I mean, like other uh, varieties, and we try uh, to put the blame on those. And if at no, all no. we treat them, they do they don't have a primary malignancy. Like what you advised, this entire workup turns out to be negative. Again, we come back to a platform where we suspect it, but we don't find the malignancy. And we get some other antibody where it is not matching with the uh, systemic findings. So in that case, agree, how do agree. you proceed? Yeah, so for optic neuritis, you know, if it is not the well-established one, if I remember, if my memory serves me right, it should be CRMP5. And, uh, and, and as we all know that for, as far as optic neuritis is concerned, uh, paraneoplastic optic neuritis is extremely rare. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. 
And likewise, uh, cancer-associated retinopathy is also uncommon and I'm blocking on the specific antibody associated with it. So because it's already a rare phenomenon, and if you find an antibody that is even more unusually associated with these syndromes, then we have a double rare syndrome. So therefore, I would probably ignore those antibodies and continue to follow the patient uh, clinically and with occasional um, tests for cancers as predicated by the clinical scenario. So, uh, but on the other hand, if I find an optic neuritis where I don't find any other cause and I find a relevant antibody like CRMP5, then I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced it is, then I will be searching very hard for an underlying malignancy. So the answer to your question is yes, because these are already very rare syndromes. Therefore, we have to be, I would be stricter with the association with the antibodies rather than associate any antibody with it because that will be a double rare phenomenon occurring in the same patient. Now, as far as the, the disease process is concerned, yes. So we will treat both. We will reduce the antigenic stimulus because the theory is that these patients are developing disimmunity because the cancer is providing some sort of antigenic mimicry, right? That is... Uh, that, that is uh, similar to the neuronal structures. So the tumor seems to be mimicking some neuronal structure and therefore the patients are reacting uh, with antibodies against the cancer, which is cross-reacting, not just antibodies, but T cells and other immunological reaction. And that is uh, acting against the neurological structure. So therefore, what we need to do is control both the cancers very aggressively with the help of the oncologist. At the same time, control the immune process. So the cancer will reduce the antigenic stimulation that's going on and make it easier for us to control the immunological process. But of course, the cancer itself needs to be treated on its own merit. So therefore, we need a combined treatment by both the oncologists as well as uh, us immunologists and very aggressive treatment for both of them for better uh, outcomes. But as, as I've alluded to in the second or third case, uh, in spite of that, depending on the type of cancers, uh, the patients often have a fulminant cause and uh, prognosis is not always uniformly good in spite of aggressive treatment of both the cancers and the, and the disimmune process. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for the question. Thank you. Uh, shall we go on to the uh, last uh, part of the thing? Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Mundi, everyone. And I apologize if there was some problem with the Wi-Fi. There's no that. problem at all. Bye bye. Uh, thank so you. Mundi, shall we go on to the last presentation? The grand yes, yes, ma'am. Request everybody to stay on. Uh, yeah. The expert comments. Uh, this is a presentation by Dr. Prakriti Agnam, who, who was our uh, Lockmo Pediatric and Neuro of the uh, fellow uh, from my foundation group, and she's going to be presenting a grand rounds case. Fool twice, twice a third time. On to you, Prakriti. Nice meeting you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening to all the eminent panelists and speakers. I feel very greatly honored and uh, fortunate to be presenting this case in your presence and on this platform. And I extend my grateful uh, gratitude to Dr. Chitra, madam, Dr. Murli Sir, and I Foundation for this opportunity. So I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to present a case where we were fooled twice but were wiser a third time. Case courtesy by Dr. Murli sir. A 45-year-old male came with complaints of vision loss in left eye, uh, which was sudden, painful and painless and after getting up from sleep. And there was no history of headache, nausea, uh, pulsatile tinnitus, fever, diplopia, transient visual obscuration. There were no similar complaints in the past. He was a known diabetic and had coronary artery disease for which he was being on medication. There was no history of smoking, alcohol, malignancy, neurosurgery, weight gain or loss. In general examination, he was conscious and coherent. Sensory and motor system were normal and cerebellum was intact. Temporal pulsations were felt and there was no jaw claudication or scalp tenderness. Vitals including blood pressure was normal. Coming to ocular examination, extraocular movements of both eyes are full and painless. Best corrected visual acuity of right eye is 66 with normal color vision, while in left eye it is 636 with very much decreased color vision. Pupils were round reacting to light with grade 2 RAPD towards the left side. 
disc showed grade 2 disc edema on the right side and grade 5 disc edema with splinter hemorrhages on the left side with macula being normal on both sides. So here is the initial fundus picture where we can see uh, disc edema in both eyes more towards the left side. Fields were normal in the right eye while left eye showed uh, severe uh, depression of the fields. Optic disc edema also showed, uh, op uh, OCT showed disc edema of both sides more on left side. So an MRI was ordered which showed features of bilateral optic nerve hydrops more on left side and contrast showed features of optic neuritis. Hemogram was normal at this stage uh, but with increased blood sugar levels. So provisional diagnosis of bilateral optic neuritis was made and he was started on pulse steroids under the care of diabetologist and neurologist. And after one week, his vision improved to 612 but still decreased in color vision and pupils RAPD was seen. Disc showed similar disc edema as we can compare both pictures the, with uh, the picture with an initial fundus picture. So gray disc edema was similar to the initial presentation. At three weeks, visual acuity was 612 with improvement in color vision and disc edema slightly improved with grade 1 disc edema in right side and uh, grade 3 with paler on left side. Uh, funda fields were normal on right side while slight improvement was seen on the left side. OCT also showed slight uh, improvement in disc edema but there was persistent edema. So since there was persistent edema and there was uh, MRI showed features of optic nerve hydrops initially under neurologist suggestion he was started on a trail of oral estazolamide. At this point we have advised of uh, lumbar puncture but it was advised against by the neurologist because of his cardiac uh, issues. One gram of estazolamide for two weeks was started followed by 1.5 grams for one month. During this treatment, his visual acuity improved to 67.5 and there was a slight improvement of disc edema. And uh, by the end of the trial, his visual acuity was 6.67.5 in left eye, while disc edema grade 1 is seen in right eye and optic atrophy towards the left side. And fields showed altitudinal field effect at this point and uh, in the left eye, while right eye fields were normal. Hemogram was normal at this point, but with slight minimal increase in ESR, while patients showed features of increased HbA1c, hyperlipidemia and borderline hyperhomocysteine. So an octa was advised, which showed uh, generalized loss of peripapillary microvasculature in both eyes, which features of superior capillary dropout in the right eye. A diagnosis of bilateral NAION was made and at 12 weeks his visual acuity was 67.5 with disc edema grade 1 in right eye and optic atrophy in the left eye. And at 16 weeks blurred margins were seen in right eye, still optic atrophy in the left eye with uh, altitudinal field effects still present, slight improvement in the fields. In his last visit which was 7 months after his uh, Initial presentation, visual acuity was 6.9 in the left eye with grade 2 RAPD and uh, disc showing blurred margins in the right eye and optic atrophy in the left eye. So the fields were uh, showing altitudinal field effects. So the main points which has tricked us in this case are presence of bilateral disc edema, MRI showing features of optic nerve hydrops and also optic neuritis is seen in contrast MRI and also uh, resolu resolution of disc edema took quite a longer time. So briefly we discussed these points and bilateral NAION simultaneous is extremely rare. It is seen in with cases with severe arterial hypotension during cardiopulmonary or major surgeries which includes massive blood loss. Some previous case reports have been uh, published regarding this where simultaneous bilateral AION is seen in patients with Bessette's disease or patients who are on phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil or severe hypotension and severe iron deficiency anemia. One of the case published in Japan Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, they showed a patient uh, with diabetes and also bilateral small crowded optic disc developing bilateral simultaneous AION. They suggested that complications of diabetes and bilateral small crowded optic disc may act as both systemic and ocular risk factors respectively and may cause this rare disc. And coming to MRI contrast findings, differentiating NAION and optic neuritis early in their disease course is important. And post uh, one journal published in Journal of uh, Neuroophthalmology showed post contrast enhancement and diffusion weighted imaging can help differentiate between these two entities. Positive findings at intraorbital segment were more favoring towards optic neuritis, while PCE and negative DWI signal at the optic disc level favors more of NAION.
And NIO, the main uh, investigation which can point out is OCTA, where two distinct patterns of loss or distortion of vasculature is seen, mainly diffuse loss of microvascular cuff and an additional area of sectoral loss of vasculature extending from the disc. And another important feature is NAION with papilledema due to IIH. There are cases where NAION and papilledema can occur simultaneously. One of the uh, previous case reports have been published and one of the report published in American Journal of Ophthalmology, they showed moderate to severe cases of papilledema can obscure the physiological cup, making the optic nerve head to be disc at risk, which is a known preceding phenomenon for NAION. Improvement of vision in NAION Severity, it depends on the severity of vision loss and degree of optic nerve injury at presentation. Clinical course stabilizes within a few weeks, at most in 2-3 to three months, while progressive visual loss after 2-3 to three months is extremely rare. And prognosis of visual recovery is better for younger patients. Coming to disc edema resolution, overall median time to resolve, spontaneously resolve the disc edema is around 7.9 weeks. The resolution time can be longer in diabetics. While steroid therapy is associated with shorter time to resolution, but final visual acuity may not alter because of the steroid therapy. And resolution of optic disc edema is shorter with greater severity of initial visual field loss or visual acuity loss because more number of axons will already be uh, undergoing ischemia by that time. So edema can will resolve faster. Coming to conclusion, diagnosis of NAION in the setting of bilateral disc edema in a relatively younger patient can be tricky. So ruling out of other causes, especially intracranial with imaging is important. And OCTA and MRA contrast findings can help us in these settings. Thank you. And very nice presentation, Prakriti. Very nice. Um, Thank you. Uh, one question is, uh, anybody uh, the panel could answer that. Uh, how long after the presentation is an OCTA going to be reliable, the diagnosis? Uh, by two weeks, it will be reliable, ma'am, because more than that, there can be diffuse capillary dropout, differentiation will be. But in our case, there is a segmental dropout after two weeks also. So, Yes, yes Dr. Ashwin. So, uh, a very, very nice uh, case and very nicely presented. There are, there are a few comments here. And I personally feel that probably this patient uh, had both uh, raised intracranial pressure and AION because even in the first field, first present field, uh, right eye probably had little enlarged blind spot while left eye had a... Uh, so patient was undergoing a raised ICP and then left just flipped over to an AION as, as you, you mentioned. Of course, the question that comes up is that what would have caused raised ICP in a in a forty six year old male? I mean, uh, would I don't know whether MRV would have helped at this juncture and uh, getting the uh, uh, LP would have been obviously patient couldn't undergo LP, but getting LP would have been helpful. The other intriguing factor, of course, would be uh, the color vision deficiency, which I think was there only in the left eye. Right eye color vision was normal, right? Yes, sir. Ah, huh. then then probably left eye color vision deficiency. Could be explained by that ischemic event, which uh, uh, which was superimposed on uh, the papillary. This is what I feel. Actually, it happens sir, that the patient had uh, stopped astrazolamide, could not tolerate astrazolamide, and uh, even though uh, he we had advised for this uh, so many days, one point five grams, he stopped abruptly, and after he stopped, the disc appearance didn't change. So that was, uh, the risk appearance actually did not change at all. So we uh, also thought the same thing that IIH could be causing the ischemic optic neuropathy in, the, in this patient. But it so happened, patient stopped astrazolamide on his own and he never had any headache or transient uh, visual obscuration, nothing of that he had. And when he stopped the astrazolamide on his own, the disc appearance did not change. So uh, so he had stopped for almost uh, three or four weeks when he came back to us and the disc appearance, because we had documented uh, every visit by serial photographs. So of course the left eye having gone into optic atrophy may not show, but the right eye uh, could have shown uh, some element of disc edema which was not there. In. So uh, that was why we felt that uh, maybe IIH uh, the cardiologist was hesitant to stop the blood thinners and uh, that was the reason why neurologist also was not very keen on doing the lumbar part. Uh, can I ask a question? So, uh, Dr. Uh, we like... Yes, madam. Actually, we wanted to ask you so many questions. Please, madam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
uh, I just uh, have one doubt. What made you make a diagnosis of IIH in this patient? Uh, apart from the imaging features and the disc appearance, because he is a male, asymmetric disc involvement, crowded optic disc appearance, and not a worse optic neuropathy in the right eye, only left eye having an asymmetric vision. No, only the, uh, no, only the, uh, this thing, madam, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, initially we thought it was an optic neuritis because the MRI feature suggested so and because of the rapid improvement of uh, uh, vision with IV steroids, we thought it was an optic neuritis. It tested anti-MOG and anti-NMO negative and uh, subsequently we had a doubt because the disc edema was not resolving. Uh, the disc edema was persisting uh, without resolve, without any uh, improvement for a um, for quite a period, for quite some time. So we discussed with the neurologist whether he could uh, get a lumbar puncture too prove or disprove IIH, but because of these limitations, because the cardiologist was uh, very hesitant to stop blood thinners. Uh, so neurologist backed out and uh, we were a little worried that even the right eye could follow suit because both eyes were having disc edema. And uh, we were initially thinking maybe it is IIH along with ischemic optic neuropathy that was in the differential. Uh, we did not expect this rapid improvement of vision, but when the alternal field defects started coming and we were uh, a little worried that the right eye could follow suit. So that was the reason why we empirically started Astra. Okay, because sometimes and, uh, we right, may have a, a over... no symptoms at all. Exactly. Uh, because sometimes no in the all, imaging no. wise, we may have this high drops and signs of an probable IIH. And in a male, when we have these findings, maybe we will not directly go for a diagnosis of IIH, or rather, unless you find secondary intracranial hypertension causes. So true, true. the uh, second thing is, um, yes, you may have some amount of spontaneous visual improvement because the right eye almost like a crowded disc. With was there uh, any FFA evidence of a disc edema in the right eye? There was evidence of disc edema, madam. Yes, but even no, the was OCT, it a, as you was it a uh, leak or something like? Because we no, did not get a fluorescent angiography, madam, but uh, there was a nerve fiber layer edema on uh, OCT, but the Brooks membrane was not pointing uh, towards the globe. It was pointing away from the globe only. So it was not suggestive of papillary edema, actually. The and OCT, uh, OCT did not show a drusen. No, no, it did not show any drusen. No. I think Dr. Uma has some points. Uh, you can put uh, share the OCT again, Prakriti, uh, once again, the EDI, the first EDI, which we did. Uh, yes, okay. Thanks, thanks, madam. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very nice presentation. I just uh, want to ask, I, I'm sorry, I missed the name of the person who presented. Preeti, right? Prakriti. I'm Prakriti, sir. Oh, oh, right. Okay. So, uh, Prakriti. Yeah? So, Dr. Prakriti, can I just ask you something about the patient's diabetic status? Yes, sir. He, he said once he was high. How long has he been diabetic? And um, diabetic since 12 years, sir. And it is slightly uncontrolled only. His HbA1c levels are around 8.1 or 2 something. And he is on insulin also along with the uh, oral anti-glycemic. And he had no retinopathy uh, or maculopathy no, no, no. at any point. No, actually, in spite of poorly controlled yes. diabetes. Huh? And uh, was there any fluctuation in blood sugars during this period? Uh, like, you know, HbA1c dropping very high from, uh, from a... Not much. More, every like. time it's more of towards higher side only. Random blood sugars more of more than 250 but lesser than 300. But no fluctuations as such. It is a kind of diabetologist care. Mm. Because I think uh, whenever we I, I, I don't understand this condition very well but I, I continue to be intrigued by this uh, entity of diabetic papillopathy and uh, in patients who seem to have flavors of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, poorly controlled diabetes, fluctuating sugars. Mm -hmm. And of course, these patients also have uh, other risk factors like, you know, uh, body habitus. So what's his body habitus like? Is he uh, obese? Sleep apneic sort of person? Uh, not as such, sir. Not me. Uh, but in, nevertheless, you know, thin people... He's thin cardiac, people. actually. He's on... Say again? He's cardiac. He's a known CAD patient, coronary artery disease. Yeah. So, you see, what's his body habitus like? Is he, you know, we, we, I, I'm sure you are familiar nowadays. We are describing the, the thin obese individuals in South Asia. These are people who are thin and BMI, as far as BMI is concerned. 
but they are actually obese because uh, their waist weight ratio is abnormal. This is a, a, a peculiar problem among us South Asians. So, uh, can you give me a flavor of what he looks like? Is he is he BMI? Is he obese? Trunkal obesity? Anything like that? Uh, average BMI only, sir. Not much higher BMI. Mildly obese. I mean, mildly. Mildly obese. Uh, mildly. Sure, sure. So, but I still think it's worthwhile screening these patients for sleep apnea also, right? Because I think that will explain some of the things that you're talking about. Okay. Sorry for the speculative questions, but, you know, I don't... I understand the difficulties of this question. I just wanted to uh, explore some of these uh, this, this aspects of ischemic optic neuropathy that's atypical. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, uh, uh, Ambika, Madam? Sharma, sir? Yeah, maybe I would have stuck to uh, what Dr. Uma had told. I would have made a diagnosis of a papillopathy in the right eye and probably thought of an NION of the left eye because still the right eye optic Actually, we also thought papillopathy in the right eye, Madam, just that the octa also showed a sectoral loss of capillaries in the right eye. You can put the yeah, octa it, in. But still well, preserved functional wise. Uh, pre preserved functional and that's wise. Incipient yes. or that stage because see, these are the end of a spectrum when we see. So okay. when it starts to begin with, it can present like that with reduced vascularity but preserved function. But left eye had a florid, uh, I mean, crowded disc with a typical NIO-like picture. Probably he would have responded once his systemic parameters are under control. But I think your patient got steroids and then he responded to the treatment. Uh, is it so, doctor? Did yes. he receive a course of steroids? Yes, ma'am. Yes, With pulse steroids, actually his visual acuity has improved. So that's why we have... Uh, it improved in two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Okay, naturally, by two to three weeks, there will be some amount of recovery also. But in this case, we will not be able to differentiate with the steroid therapy. And the other thing is, we can have these sort of optic nerve signals on imaging, which, as you rightly pointed, they are not enhancing or a DWI positive signals as opposed to an optic neuritis type of signals. So we need not get, because this can be more specific if we suspect a GCA. Because GCA will have a real enhancing signal and that's a real difficult uh, differentiation between an optic neuritis versus a GCA ischemic uh, uh, hyperintense signal on an MRI. So this patient, I may uh, beg to differ. I may still put it as OS alone as an NION and I will withhold the steroid, improve his general parameters and probably watch it rather than trying to make a, I mean, like put on a steroid therapy or make a presumptive diagnosis of IIH in the absence of the red flags in a male for an IIH. True, true, madam, very true. Sharma, sir, anything? Uh, Rashmin, uh, Dr. Rashmin? No, I, uh, so it does sound like, though, I mean, I'm quite intrigued, as I, as I said, about the right eye. Uh, and uh, the behavior, and obviously you can't put IIH, if at all, if you're looking at, you're looking at raised ICD, because uh, uh, as we said, patient profile is not really matching for IIH, if at all. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, uh, the Diamox, and though you, you did uh, clarify that Diamox probably patient did not take, and that may not have had any impact on the resolution of uh, disc edema in the left eye. The kidney status, the renal status was fine? Uh, yes, sir, it's fine. He had no renal. Nice case, Dr. Prakriti. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So I think uh, we have also come to the end of our webinar. And uh, it goes without saying that each and every one of us truly enjoyed the last uh, couple of hours, you know, two and a half hours. And it was just that we just transported to a different world of thought processes and we got back. Um, so thank you so much, each and every one of you for making this eye educational initiative so much more uh, uh, colorful and nice. Thanks a lot, uh, Murli, for uh, all the planning and uh, thank you one and all. I think we should all go back for dinner. Yeah. Look forward to having you all again for part two and part three with uh, Murli is visualizing. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Thank you.